he can testify later if he shows up or at the work session. Okay. All right, good to go. All right, uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Jim Dill, I'm the Senate Chair of the ACF committee. And I wanna welcome everybody here this morning. We have uh, two public hearings on bills and then we have a briefing from the Blueberry Commission. And uh, so without further ado, we'll go right ahead and get everyone introduced. And I'll start with Representative Osher. Good morning, I'm Lori Osher. Uh, District 123, that's most of Orno, the home of the University of Maine. Uh, Senator Maxman. Hi there, I'm Chloe Maxman. I represent Senate District 13, which is all of Lincoln County, except for Dresden, plus Washington and Windsor. Uh, Representative Gifford. I'm Representative Jeff Gifford. I live in Lincoln and I represent District 142. Uh, Representative Hall. Good morning, Randy Hall, uh, District 114, uh, six towns in Southern Franklin County. Representative Schofield. Good morning, everyone. I'm Tom Schofield and I represent House District 112. I live in the great little town of Weld, Maine, and I represent 17 towns and townships in Franklin and Somerset counties the High Peaks region of Maine. Representative McRae. Yes, good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm Dave McRae. I live in Fort Fairfield, home of the Maine Potato Blossom Festival in the summer, uh, and I'm happy to be here. Representative Bernard. Good morning, everyone. I'm Sue Bernard. I represent District 149, which is Caribou, New Sweden, and Westmanland. Representative Landry. Uh, good morning, everyone. Scott Landry. I represent District 113, Farmington and New Sharon, and I live in beautiful Farmington, Maine, where the wind blows really hard with a northwest view. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning. Um, my name is Maggie O'Neill, and I'm here representing House District 15, which is in Zocco. Senator Black. Good morning, Senator Black from Wilton. I represent all of Franklin County and four towns in Kennebec. Representative Underwood. I'm Representative Underwood, District 147, Prescow. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. And again, I'm Jim Dill. I represent Senate District Number 5, Northern Penobscot County. And uh, it is a public hearing today. So uh, uh, I just remind uh, everyone uh, that is in the form of a question. Please remain muted until you're um, ready to speak. That way it helps with back background noise and everything. And also be mindful to be uh, respectful of everybody, uh, the committee members and uh, people testifying. And I would uh, say the same thing of people testifying, be respectful. And uh, we can uh, go ahead and get started the way we will run, run our hearings. I will have a three minute timer. When the timer goes off, I will say the time is up. You have one or two sentences to finish up. So I will interrupt you. Um, I'm not trying to be rude, but uh, we have lots to do. We got lots we got to have. Uh, we're on a timeline to get things done. So we have to stay on schedule. This way, everybody has the same amount of time to speak. And we'll start with the sponsor, followed by any other legislators, um, then anyone from the department who's speaking, and then we'll go to uh, people testifying, and we'll start with the people in favor, followed by against, and then finish up with neither for nor against. Um, our clerk this morning is Cheryl McGowan, and Karen Netto is our analyst. Um, Co-chair O'Neill, anything you want to add? No, thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, with that, I am going to open the hearing on LD 1158, an act regarding the application of certain pesticides for non-agricultural use. And with that is Representative Collins. Good morning. Good morning, um, Senator Dale. Can you hear me okay? Yes. 
Okay, good. I know my last bill on a different committee, I was going in and out, so I wasn't sure if it was my computer or not. But um, uh, good morning, Senator Dill, Representative O'Neill, distinguished members of the committee. I'm Benjamin Collings. I represent House District 42, which is part of the city of Portland. Um, thank you for uh, taking a few minutes to hear the uh, my presentation of the of this bill this morning. So, so in essence, this bill um, looks to do two two things. Very very uh, easy to understand here for you. Uh, I'm going to just break them up in two different categories and. Um, Kind of give you the reasoning why the the first part of it and the main component of this bill is uh, inspired by a, an ordinance that happened in the city of Portland a few years ago, which I uh, thought was pretty cool um, and I was highly in favor of. And I found out that uh, not just in Portland, but there's approximately I think 31 towns that have ordinances of varying degree that limit the um, the amount of synth uh, persistent synthetic. Uh, pesticides to be used in their communities. Now they're all different. Uh, several of them deal with just the aerial spraying. Uh, some of them uh, talk about uh, you know a broad uh, ban of, of use of um, different um, synthetics in their communities. There's a limited number of communities that go so far as to actually ban the sell of certain products in their stores. Uh, many of them are kind of a sort of a, of a hybrid. They're a mix and they have um, they ban certain application in certain places, but they do uh, have exemptions or they do have um, a process where there's waivers and you can you can come in and, and, and apply for a waiver. If you have a, uh, a compelling reason, the uh, the local community uh, will, will hear that. Uh, and then some communities do allow um, use of certain um, synthetics for uh, landscaping or for golf courses or whatnot. Uh, all of them vary. The point is, is that there are synthetic um, toxins that are that are very harmful to people, to wildlife, especially for um, young developing children. You know, their, their brains, their, their body overall, and so that that's the reason why dozens of communities um, throughout the state. It's not just Portland or South Portland. We also have um, you know places in Allagash and in, in Amherst, Maine in Blue Hill, in um, New Sweden, it's it's all over the state. Um, so, um, and some have been on the books for decades, some some of them are more recent, and many communities are discussing making their own, their own ordinances to deal with this. So that's that's kind of the, um, the inspiration for this bill. Um, I'm very uh, well aware of um, kind of home rule in Maine and about local control. Uh, and I'm sure some people will discuss that that later about why this is being proposed at a statewide level when, you know, dozens of communities are doing it on their own, why this is needed. And I think it's very simply, there are certain synthetics that, that stay around forever and are, are known to cause harm. And um, so if, if they're causing harm in one community, they're obviously causing harm in all the main communities. And as state lawmakers, we need to assess that risk and how that's impacting um, our, our, uh, our residents and our wildlife. And um, what I'd like to say on this component of the bill, I would hope that um, moving forward after this hearing and going into work sessions and whatnot, that we can look at common denominators and um, come to some consensus um, with everyone on this committee about where should we absolutely not be having application of these products uh, where do we absolutely need to protect our, our citizenry and our and our habitat and, and look specifically, um, for example, at uh, public spaces, at school playgrounds, uh, town parks, uh, libraries, um, you know, uh, waterfronts in, in towns. For example, in Amherst, they have an ordinance that's geared just on on their water um, in, in the community. That's what it's is geared for. So I hope the committee will look at this carefully and really kind of rally around places where the overuse of these um, synthetics are, are, are detrimental to the health of people in Maine and really come up with some, some ways to, to address that. The second component of the bill deals with the Maine Pesticide Board. And I'll tell you real quickly, uh, very simply where that came from was while I was in discussion with people that are have been working on this issue for years, who are much more articulate on this, I mean, 
I understand the big picture and what's kind of right and what's wrong here. I'm I'm not a uh, a chemist. I don't understand everything about chemicals. Um, uh, but people did tell me that um, I should as well look at at what happens in the main pesticide board and that how that would apply to communities and policies throughout the state, and that there might have been a shift over the past ten years or so with the main pesticide board from really looking at limiting and protecting people from pesticides for it being going more towards um, advocating uh, more for certain industries to use pesticides. And if that's the case, I would like the committee as well and the uh, the commissioner of ag to really look at that. And um, I have been told that in addition to my bill, there are other proposals out there with sponsors who are much more articulate on this matter that seek to do similar things and may, might be more appropriate vehicles to address issues with the Board of Pesticides. And of course, that's a discretion of this committee, but I, I would absolutely not um, try to stand in the way. And I would defer to you if you think there is a other proposal that more wholly and, and, to, a, and to a better degree um, addresses the issues of the main Board of Pesticide and what that board makeup should look like then absolutely I would um, be happy to strip that from this bill and really focus on on this bill with you on on ordinances that exist and why we should look at some variants of those ordinances to apply to a, to a statewide level and specifically um, why we need to protect our, uh, our public, especially where young children and families are gathering in public spaces. Um, there are many people after me that can talk more about uh, what happens in what happened in Portland with this ordinance? What happened in other communities? Um, issues with the board of pesticides, very technical issues on pesticides, and the difference between synthetics and organic, and 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 why there's this uh, debate going on. So I would defer to them. But at this this time, uh, again, thank you for allowing me to present this bill, which I think is very important, and I believe it's important not just to me and people in Portland where where I represent. But I believe it's important to people all over the state as you, um, if I'm sure you already have it, but I'll send it to the clerk to um, dispense to all of you. You can see the 31 communities that have ordinances to some degree. And I, and I hope you will seriously consider why people in dozens of Maine communities have submitted these ordinances over the year. And while you'll, you'll see many more communities doing this um, moving forward. Um, so I, I think it's appropriate you have this conversation and you look to um, limit uh, the use of certain synthetics that really don't need to be used uh, in certain cases. So thank you for your time. I'd be happy to answer any questions. And I'm sure there are others that will speak after me that are experts in this area that could be much more articulate and uh, satisfy whatever uh, questions you may have. So thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any questions for Representative Collins? All right, seeing none, again, thank you. Uh, next up will be Ann Gibbs from the department, followed by Avery Yale, Don Neptune, and Heather Spaulding. So good morning, Ms. Gibbs. Good morning, Senator Dill. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Good morning, Senator Dill, Representative O'Neill, and members of the committee. I'm Ann Gibbs, the Director of Animal and Plant Health Division of the Bureau of Agriculture, Food and Rural Resources within the Department of Ag Conservation and Forestry. I'm here today to speak in opposition to LD 1158, an act regarding the application of certain pesticides for non-agricultural use. By way of background, the Board of Pesticide Control um, is the main lead agency for pesticide oversight whose responsibilities include protecting public and environmental health. The board is further charged with finding ways to minimize reliance on pesticides through the promotion of integrated pest management or IPM and other science-based strategies for controlling pests. The board's area of oversight and stewardship, pesticide distribution and use has remained the same um, since it was established in 1965. However, demand for these services has steadily increased. By statute, it is the policy of the state to, 
to work to find ways to use the minimum amount of pesticides needed to effectively control targeted pests in all areas of application. Pesticide usage is, con is allowed but controlled and regulated by the BPC. Further, state agencies that regulate or use pesticides must promote the principles and the implementation of integrated pest management and other science-based technology to minimize reliance on pesticides. This bill will prohibit the use of all synthetic pesticides used for any purpose other than the production of agricultural products. In doing so, LD 1158 profoundly changes decades of pesticide policy management and protections that have been effectuated in Maine with many consequential impacts as a result. Some concerns we have about the synthetic definition. It is important to note that the bill's definition of synthetic matches the definition used by the U.S. Department of Agriculture for the National Organic Program. Notably, NLP's definition pertains solely to the production of food and not to the enormous array of pest management scenarios addressed under existing Maine law. The pest complexes affected, affecting agricultural crops are vastly different from pest complexes infesting homes, rotting wood, and threatening human health, for instance. Further, the meaning of the term persistent in the definition is unclear. Persistence is an important consideration for the regulation of pesticides, one that is accounted for by EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, and numerous other national and international regulatory agencies who have produced a variety of definitions. At present, main registered products contain a total of approximately 850 pesticide active ingredients. That's both synthetic and naturally occurring. The number of these active ingredients that would remain available following the implementation of this bill will depend on the interpretation of synthetic and persistence. It is the case that some synthetic pesticides are less toxic than some naturally occurring pesticides, while others are less persistent. However, some naturally occurring pesticides may be as toxic and or persistent as synthetic pesticides. For example, strychnine and tobacco dust, uh, often known as nicotine sulfate, are both natural substances, but also prohibited from use as pesticides due to their relative toxicity. Copper presents acute and chronic toxicity and persistence concerns. Metallic substances like zinc and sulfur persist and can cont contaminate surface water. So the scope of the synthetic uses, the bill prohibits the use of synthetic pesticides for all uses other than the production of agricultural products. The cited definition of agricultural products does not include trees grown and harvested for forest products. Given the current statutory definition of forest products and the reference definition of agricultural products, if this bill becomes law, the only purposes for which the synthes excuse me, synthetic pesticides may be used will be, and I will just paraphrase a little bit, plants and animals and their products that are useful to humans and include um, many different uses such as forages and, and dairy, poultry, et cetera. But basically the bottom line, products that supply humans with food, feed, fiber, and fur. Additionally, um, we have shared with the committee a separate document which outlines additional concerns and impacts to current industries, including forestry, ornamental um, pests, public health, transportation, and manufacturing. There are about 28 scenarios listed. Um, I will highlight a few, but in, in order to, to be um, conscious of time, but I urge you to review the list when you are reviewing um, the testimony. So a couple of things to consider, um, ornamental management of ornamental, um, outdoor ornamentals, such as to control things like gypsy moth, hemlock woolly adelgid and emerald ash borer, um, aquatic pest control, to control mosquito larvae and invasive fish species and invasive aquatic plants, um, vegetative uh, management of right-of-ways, both transportation and utility, um, structural pest control to deal with cockroaches, rodents, bed bugs, um, and then management of human and animal diseases, 
um, often using sanita sanitizers and disinfectants, and management of biting flies and arthropod vectors such as ticks, uh, brown tail moth, uh, and the flea and tick colors that you use on your, on your animals. So the second part of, of this bill um, will instruct the commissioner of DACF to convene a working group to review the composition of the Board of Pesticides Control. The group will assess the equitable representation of public, environmental, and industry interests by the board. The working group will identify the appearance of any financial conflict of interest and report back to the ACF committee by December 1, 2021. We do not believe that this effort is necessary and believe the current statutory organization and design surrounding board membership is working well. At present, the board is comprised of one person with practical experience and knowledge regarding agricultural use of chemicals, one person who has practical experience and knowledge regarding the use of chemicals in forest management, one person from the medical community, a scientist from the University of Maine system having practical experience and expertise in integrated pest management, one commercial applicator, and two persons appointed to represent the public. This represents a broad spectrum of perspectives, technical expertise, and training that is highly relevant to the work and duties of the board. As a result, it is possible to have on the board uh, people who are currently employed in a profession where pesticide use is conducted. If that rises to the appearance of financial conflict of interest, the board may lose out on the otherwise relevant practical and technical experience of highly trained members of the board. Lastly, the committee has direct oversight of the board nominees through the confirmation process and can always discuss any conflict concerns as necessary. Thank you for your time. I would be happy to answer your questions now and I will also be available um, to answer questions during the work session as will Director Patterson. Uh, thank you. Are there any questions for Director Gibbs? <laughs> All right, seeing none. Thank you for your testimony this morning. Thanks. Next is Avery Yale Camilla. Hello, good morning, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, excellent. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Senator Dill, Representative O'Neill and members of the Agriculture Conservation and Forestry Committee. Uh, my name is Avery Yale Camilla and I'm the co-founder of Portland Protectors. I serve on Portland's Pesticide Management Advisory Committee and I'm accredited in organic land care by the Northeast Organic Farming Association. Since the Portland City Council adopted its organic land care ordinance in 2018, Portland residents report seeing more pollinators in the city, a new all organic Eldridge hardware store has opened and the existing hardware store, Main Hardware has voluntarily replaced synthetic products with organic soil amendments. Because of our positive experience in Portland, I urge you to support LD1158 I also urge you to support LD1159 since the current main board of pesticides control isn't qualified to respond to the rapidly changing marketplace in public sentiment, which is demanding organic land care. I have began advocating for science-based pesticide laws after my property rights were taken from me in 2005. This happened when a former neighbor sprayed the synthetic pesticide glyphosate, trade name Roundup, along the fence line separating our properties. The pesticide drifted onto my property and severely damaged two cedar trees. I spoke with the neighbor about his actions. He said he thought Roundup was safe because its sale and use are freely permitted in Maine. He did not wear the protective gear required by the label. In the past, licensed pesticide applicators sprayed Portland side sidewalks with glyphosate. Portland residents protested this land care choice for decades until it was finally banned. On multiple occasions, I saw these professional applicators spraying without wearing the required protective gear. 
Thankfully, both of these cosmetic pesticide applications of glyphosate are now illegal in Portland. My property rights have been protected. Portland is just one of 30 main municipalities that have done a lot of work to enact stricter pesticide regulations than those adopted by the main legislature. I urge you to follow the lead of these main towns and restore the property rights of all main people by restricting the use of synthetic pesticides in cosmetic landscaping situations. If this committee is not prepared to move forward with a full organic land care ordinance for Maine, please consider a first step of requiring organic land care on specific properties such as playgrounds, near aquifers, along right of ways, or on all state owned parks and property. Thank you so much for listening to me and for your valuable public service. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, perfect timing. <laughs> Good. <laughs> uh, are there any questions? All right, seeing none. Next on my list is Don Neptune Adams. Good morning. Willis Buzzaway, good morning. I am Don Neptune Adams, a member of the Penobscot Nation and also a journalist and activist with Sunlight Media Collective. I'm here to speak in favor of the bill today, uh, an act to ban certain uh, synthetic um, pesticides from non-agricultural use. I'd first like to start with uh, a very positive example that almost everybody knows about. Um, we had a decline in eagle population um, for a while because after World War II, the use of DDT, a, a DDT pesticide, um, was causing their eggs uh, to be too thin, the shells of their eggs. And so they had a, a, low, um, a low birth rate. That is one huge uh, example of uh, the banning of pesticides that had a, a huge um, outcome. When we look at these issues, uh, issues of using chemicals um, and, and spraying them into our, our own ecosystem, we usually look at the, the, uh, <clears throat> the result in terms of human, uh, how humans are affected. But I think we need to look at how all of our relatives are affected by these chemicals that we're using. Um, one of the, the biggest things is the water. Um, you know, putting chemicals into our own water that we drink, these can negatively affect, um, you know, especially children and elders. A little over a year ago, um, a Republican representative came up to me and asked if there were any issues going on with the Mi'kmaq people in the, the area of the state where that he represents. And I was reminded of a time when um, my sister was dating a Mi'kmaq man. And he told us that he went hunting in his, um, his family's traditional hunting grounds which just so happened to be uh, covered with um, power lines. Well, he said they were spraying the power lines with, um, with pesticides and herbicides. And that when he went hunting there, there, were, there was nothing to hunt. He said he couldn't even hear any bugs there um, and that he feared that it was going into their wells as well. So having some oversight on this, um, I think is, is a, a really good idea. I'm gonna to listen to everybody's testimony and uh, learn some more about this. Um, and I welcome any questions. Thank you for listening. Thank you, are there any questions? All right, seeing none. Uh, next up will be Heather Spaulding, followed by Jim Gerritsen, Patricia Rupert Nason, and Rachel Berger.
Uh, good morning, Senator Dill, Representative O'Neill, and members of the Joint Standing Committee on Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry. My name is Heather Spaulding, and I'm Deputy Director of MOFCA, Maine Organic Farmers and Gardeners Association. I'm speaking in support of LD 1158 with specific recommendations for a manageable approach to the bill's two sections. Because MOFCA's recommendations for moving this bill forward relate directly to another bill that we support, 11, uh, LD 1159, I've um, combined my written testimony on the two bills. Um, we're so appreciative of the leadership shown by Representative Collins and Representative Osher. Um, I'm gonna focus my remarks now on 1158. Um, I'm on my way to get my second COVID shot, so um, my connection, but Thanks for bearing with me. Um, on 1158, MOFCA supports the spirit of Section 1, and we feel that it's an important and substantive initial step um, to focus on helping homeowners and uh, schoolyard managers and public park managers wean themselves from reliance on synthetic pesticides um, used simply to make landscapes look pretty. The state should adopt a precautionary approach to land care and help people manage their landscapes using organic practices. It's time for Maine to rededicate itself to its stated policy of minimizing reliance on pesticides and move beyond the relative risk approach that has resulted in contaminated water, land, air, wildlife, and human bodies. LD 1158 follows the commendable approach that Representative Grahowski has taken with her bill to phase out landscaping use of neonicotinoid pesticides. Since MOFCA started back in 1971, our members have advocated for policies that protect human health and the environment from harmful effects of pesticides. Awareness is growing about the inherent dangers of pesticides, yet Maine people are deprived of access to comprehensive pesticide sales and use data in the state. The last report about homeowner use of pesticides in Maine was released by the BPC in 2015, indicating a dramatic increase in the use of pesticides. 700% increase in use by homeowners and lawn and tree care companies over the prior two decades. We are just astounded by that figure, especially after Governor Baldacci, way back in, 20, in 2006, signed an executive order calling on the department and the and cooperative extension to educate homeowners about less toxic alternatives to pesticides. And among many other important measures, his order also required the Bureau of General Services in consultation with the BPC and extension to prohibit the use of fertilizer pesticide mixtures or other pesticides for purely cosmetic purposes on state grounds. What happened? We don't remember the order being repealed, but apparently it has been ignored. We need LD 1158 and 1159 to get us back on track to a healthier future for Maine people and the environment. Um, I will tune back in to hear on LD 1159, um, but I really feel that implementing these measures um, in an amended way could really help us get on track to minimizing Maine's reliance on pesticides. Thank you so much for your careful consideration. Thank you. Uh, Representative Underwood. Hi, good morning, uh, Mrs. Spaulding. Uh, I think, I believe that this is a local issue. If you have, like, the city of Portland has a problem with the pesticides, they sh and uh, the city isn't helping them, or they're having additional problems, they should go to the county. Uh, this is not a state problem. So why uh, why do you want a regulation in that's that's uh, that benefits Rooster County greatly and uh, a uh, and a board that benefits Rooster County greatly. Why would the city of Portland want to ban something that helps them out? I don't understand that. Could you assist me with understanding it, please, on a statewide basis versus a local basis? Thank you. Yeah, I think this is just getting at the concern that public citizens have about you know, the, the problems, the, the human health and environmental problems that are growing. I mean, every single day you find more and more peer-reviewed studies showing the very serious harm that synthetic and persistent pesticides cause to human health and the environment. There are organic practices that are very effective and that can be used in a much healthier, safer way than many of these chemicals. 
and we just feel like the time has come where we need, or it's, it's long past, it's long overdue. I mean, as I mentioned, Governor Baldacci called for uh, a stop to using these chemicals for landscaping purposes, um, you know, two, in 2006. So we just, we need to get back on track. We're, we're losing time, we're going in the wrong direction and there's no need of it. And this doesn't affect the, the farmers in Arista County. This, this specifically does not have any relation to agricultural uses of chemicals. This is really about helping, um, helping, well, it, it, it could be more specifically clarified. I agree that there's some amended language that needs to be added, um, but I feel like a really important first step is to follow the, the approach that 31 communities in Maine have adopted, which is to you know, uh, opt for safer land care, landscape management practices. Follow-up follow up question, um, sure. Mr. Chairman. Uh, a follow-up question basically is, Arista County has a lot of uh, land management companies that have a lot of land management like, uh, land companies for timber. And they use, they use pesticides, some of the pesticides, to kill specific weeds and specific Insect control is different, like the borash. They have a they have specific use for these chemicals, and uh, this bill does not does not exempt uh, forest management land management company for for treatment of forest. So, um, do you why I, I just can't understand why something that would might benefit might benefit Portland resident. Uh, why, would, why can't they go back to the city of Portland, the, the local control issue again, uh, versus or county control issue versus the, the, the county of uh, Cumberland? Uh, why can't they go back to them and, and talk to these people and discuss it with these people and leave the state alone? And as far as the board goes, the board is composed with a lot of thoughtful. And that is a uh, decision that should be made by this committee. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. Remind everybody, uh, committee members, that uh, uh, make sure that you're asked a question. Heather, did you want to respond to that? Oh. Well, I wasn't sure if it was a question or not, but it, it sounded like you wanted to follow up. But um, but that's fine. I think there are other people waiting who can speak, um, who can answer those questions for you, Representative Underwood. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Representative O'Neill. Sure, sure. I only wanted to make a note that um, we should stick to questions um, yeah. in here. All right, thank you. Uh, yes, one, one, the question was, why, why isn't it, that, why doesn't she go to the, or why didn't they go to the county, uh, like Cumberland County and discuss it with the county and have them form a regulation or something to try and solve this instead of the state? Why, why can't, if she doesn't get a satisfactory answer from the city of Portland, go to the county. This is not a statewide problem. Uh, why, why can't she go to the county is the question. Okay. Thank you. Heather, can you? I okay. Um, sure. Okay, thank you. Mr. Rep Chair, first I, and I'm so sorry to interrupt Ms. Walding. I just want to interject that um, I, I want to note that um, I understand that, you know, there are two sides to this issue. Um, I think we can use a tone that is, um, that's more respectful of, of our guests. And, uh, and we're also, I want to note, we're not speaking to the sponsor of the bill, um, but if Ms. Spalding would like to respond, I want to give her space to do that. Um, okay, thank you so much. Um, Representative O'Neill and Representative Underwood, um, I, I think that this, it's, it's important to note that there are more than 30, I think there are currently 31 communities throughout the state, including in Arista County, even the town, even the um, township of Allagash has an ordinance along the lines of this um, initiative. So I feel like it, there is statewide concern and, um, and, it's not, again, it's not um, applying to agricultural um, practices. And we have laid out in our testimony some suggestions for how it could be um, 
strategically organized to address a certain sector initially so that we can move towards safer um, management practices. Thank you. Are there any other questions? All right. Again, thank you for your testimony this morning. Next is Jim Garretson. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, good morning. I'm Jim Garretson. Uh, we have an organic farm in Aroostook County. We've been farming for 45 years, and I want to speak in support of both LD 1158 and LD 1159. And I've submitted written comments on our behalf. So I thought I'd just take this time to highlight some of them. But uh, I guess what, what stands out to me is that for almost 25 years, we've had statewide policy calling for minimizing uh, pesticide use. And I, I really think that it's hard to find evidence that we're fulfilling that policy. And I think this, these bills, especially 1158, heads us in the right direction. It focuses primarily on the um, use of ornamentals uh, that, and it does exempt agricultural food production. Uh, so I think in that way, uh, the experience of the 31 towns that have already passed this uh, is an indication that it's uh, legislation that would work and would cut down the toxin load of persistent synthetic chemicals and that's uh, along the lines of long-term state policy. As far as the Board of Pesticide Control, the lack of progress can only cause one to wonder is there a financial conflict of interest in the operation of BPC as to why we're not making progress. Uh, Maine is not alone in the fact that regulators often uh, become very comfortable with the regulated and it affects uh, the operation. And the reality is we've got a population of 1.3 million people and about 7,000 farmers in the state. And what all state agencies, uh, legislators, uh, the whole ball of wax need to be doing is putting the public good first ahead of any personal self-interest. And if there is a financial conflict of interest, then I think it ought to be identified and people should be recusing themselves. So uh, Representative Collings uh, legislation asking for a review of this, it would be interesting to me to find out how often members of BPC have been recusing themselves from discussions and votes on issues that affect their uh, personal livelihoods or industry livelihoods. Uh, but my, my skepticism of Board of Pesticide Control goes back four decades to the time that we were uh, accidentally sprayed with the spruce budworm project. Um, I'm experienced in this. I've been, uh, uh, I've had a license as a private uh, uh, applicator for 30 years. I'm required to do that by BPC. Uh, but that skepticism about the fairness and the effectiveness of how BPC operates goes back for four decades. So I'd be happy to answer any questions if there are any, but I, uh, in closing, would urge the committee to support both of these bills. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Senator uh, Maxman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you, Mr. Gerritsen, for being here today. Um, you talked a lot about not seeing evidence that we were moving um, towards a more restricted pesticide use in Maine. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about what made you say that and um, just give a little bit more specifics around yeah. that comment. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so back in April of 1979, after having made uh, every uh, effort to be exempted from being sprayed by the spruce budworm suppression project, we were accidentally sprayed by the state of Maine, which was running that uh, program and lost our organic certification for three years as, as a result. So uh, jump forward 11 months after that to March of 2019, uh, uh, let me say, losing track here, 1980, 41 years ago. And I went down, as did many of us, to Augusta to a hearing of uh, Board of uh, Pesticide Control 
Uh, the hearing began at one in the afternoon. I gave testimony at 1130 that night. Uh, there were probably 100 people uh, there. And then after I gave my testimony, uh, the operations manager for Globe Air, which was the company out of Tucson, Arizona, that had conducted the uh, spray program. They had 62 fixed wing aircraft. That um, uh, manager of the program was one of the owners of the company. And he admitted under oath to the Board of Pesticide Control that he had never even read the label application on the barrels of seven carbaryl, what we were accidentally sprayed with. So. That's, even at that time, I, I knew that there is a requirement under federal law to follow federal law. The label uh, on the uh, pesticide has the same binding as federal law. And here's the manager of the program admitting under oath that he had not even read the label directions. Yet the Board of Pesticide Control, when, when asked to disqualify this company as not being uh, uh, qualified to operate in Maine was allowed to spray the next year. And it came across to those of us in attendance that this is a kangaroo court. What more basic violation could there have been? So then when I couple that with the lack of progress in minimizing pesticides being sprayed in Maine, it, it just comes to mind these cozy relationships between uh, those who are regulated and the regulators and the potential for financial conflict of interest, that would explain uh, the misbehavior that goes back over 40 years. Representative Hall. Yes, thank you, Senator Dill. Um, quick question I would have is, uh, I'm not certain, I don't believe, can you answer this? Is there any of the people that were on the Board of Pesticides in, back in the 1979 and 1980 still on the Board of Pesticides at this point? A better question might be, are any of them still alive? But my point is that I haven't seen evidence that we're making progress to minimize the pesticide. It's been policy for 25 years. And why is that? And it comes to my mind that there's that financial conflict of interest. It, it's not, uh, Maine is not the only state that uh, suffers from that. It's an institutional problem. But Maine is where we can make the change to support uh, the citizens of Maine from from uh, heavy toxin load, and this is a these bills are an effort to try to you know correct what we haven't been doing. Any other questions? Thank you for testimony, Jim, this morning. Thank you. Our next is Patricia Rupert Nason. Thank you very much. Um, so Senator Dale, Representative O'Neill, and members of the Joint Committee on Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry, um, as mentioned, my name is Patricia Rupert Nason, um, and I'm speaking today on behalf of Sierra Club and the over 20,000 members and supporters in Maine. Um, we believe that the regulation of persistent pesticides is an important issue. Um, we do are concerned that LD 1158 is not currently clear, uh, we recommend that the bill be amended to define a persistent pesticide, and we'd like to offer a potential definition. Um, so persistent pesticides are a special concern because they tend to accumulate in the environment with repeated applications. Um, one definition currently being used elsewhere uh, is that persistent pesticide means any pesticide or its metabolites of equal or greater toxicity, which will be present in the environment beyond one year from the date of application. Um, no, notably, just from a basic math perspective, any, perspective, any pesticide which meets this definition will tend to accumulate in the environment if it's applied one or more times per year. And hence, we believe should be strictly regulated really for all applications. Um, that being said, um, I'd like to offer you a definition that might be uh, easier to implement, uh, which is that persistent means uh, pesticides with half-lives greater than 30 days in the environment for the active ingredient, other toxic ingredients, or their breakdown products of greater toxicity. Half-life is a common measure of breakdown. Um, it's available for many pesticides in tables even generally on the internet, and I believe this is generally um, one of the things that is analyzed um, by pesticide companies. 
So the breakdown of pesticides in the environment can be complicated, but a good first order approximation can be achieved by looking at half-lives. Um, information on those half-lives is available from the National Pesticide Information Center, uh, as well as I imagine other sources. Um, and in toxicology, a substance is generally considered to have been eliminated after five half-lives, which corresponds to about 3% remaining. Um, on the face of it, that would indicate um, persistence for one year would correspond to a half-life of 70 days. Uh, however, breakdown rates uh, are dependent on environment, and given Maine's long cold winter and that breakdown generally slows down with reduced temperatures, um, I would argue that something on the order of 30 days might be a more appropriate guidepost. Um, so I can speak further on the pros and cons of half-life as a measure if you'd like, but in the interest of time, I'll move on for now. I did want to insert a personal note. Um, I am a resident of Aroostook County, and I'm also the parent of young children. And I would love to see less pesticides used in places where we live and play, as I do worry about their exposure. Um, that especially means, you know, casual use by my neighbors and lawn companies um, in the landscape, on playgrounds, in the yards surrounding me. But it also is that use in the forests, because we swim in the rivers that come down out of those forests. Um, and pesticides, in general, don't stay where they're put. Can you finish uh, up? So, in sentence? closing. Yep, thank you. What's that? I said finish up in a sentence or two, please. Okay, so I we support, we think LD is 1158 is a step in the right direction, um, but think there's room for uh, amending to improve it. Thank you. Are there any questions? All right, seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Next is uh, Rachel Berger, followed by Sally Trice, Andrew Hackman, and Anthony, Anthony Horahan. So Rachel, could you unmute yourself? Can you hear me now? I can. Thank you for inviting me to this important discussion. Um, South Portland has had a pesticide ordinance now for a number of years, which actually um, relates to the whole of South Portland, including private property. Um, it started with us being disturbed about the use of pesticide. Uh, young people were spraying it along the roads with pesticide being able to even go on their legs and so on. Um, anyhow, the city has embraced it and now other cities have too, which is I think wonderful. Basically, I'm very glad this is being de debated on a statewide level. I think that's great. Altogether, since the Second World War when pesticides were introduced a great deal of toxicity has been added to our lives and the less that is used, the better. Um, I think it is industry driven and causes a great deal of harm to all manner of life. The birds, the insects, people, our pets, our children. The, there's so much more cancer and other illnesses present now than there used to be. Basically, I would encourage people to turn to organic care. I think if you aren't going to use pesticides, you probably need to pay attention to organic care, which means mowing high, aerating, using organic fertilizer, and overseeding with the right kind of grass. This would keep the so-called industry very happy, making beautiful lawns, healthy lawns for people. We don't need to use pesticides. I was very horrified to find that pesticides are even being used in Maine woods. That is hard to understand. The less use, the better. The more organic farms we have, the better. I think I will stop now. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? All right, seeing none, thank you for your testimony. And next is Sally Trice. Hello, I'm Sally, I'm from Portland, and I was, um, I was a part of the crusade for banning pesticides in, here in Portland. 
And I'm very happy that that has happened, of course. Um, I want to mention, we hear a lot about the active ingredient of glyphosate. Uh, it, not much is said about the, what are called inert ingredients. Active ingredients usually comprise about 5% of the actual product. The other ingredients are all inert, but they're all toxic. They're not even required to talk a lot about them on the label. So anyway, it's important that we, um, in fact, it says 800 of the 1200 inerts are classified as unknown toxicity, and yet 57 is highly toxic. So uh, what I want to add is that um, of 30 commonly used lawn pesticides, 13 are probable or possible carcinogens. This is information from Beyond Pesticides in Washington, DC. 13 commonly used pesticides are linked with birth defects, 21 with reproductive effects, 15 with neurotoxicity, 26 with liver or kidney damage, 27 are sensitizers and or irritants, and 11 have the potential to disrupt the endocrine or hormonal system. Going on. Pregnant women, infants, and children, the aged and the chronically ill are at greatest risk from pesticide exposure and chemically induced immune suppression, which can increase susceptibility to cancer. Children. Children take in more pesticides relative to body weight than adults and have developing organic organ systems that make them more vulnerable and less able to detoxify toxins. The National Academy of Sciences estimates that 50% of lifetime pesticide exposure occurs during the first five years of life. A study published in the Journal of National Cancer Institute finds home and garden pesticide use can increase the risk of childhood leukemia by almost seven times. And finally, studies show levels of exposure to actual lawn pesticide products are linked to increased rates of miscarriage and suppression of the nervous, endocrine, and immune systems. Uh, exposure to home and garden pesticides can increase a child's likelihood of developing asthma. So that covers quite a few different topics. Uh, but I, And I just wanted to mention also, I think someone spoke of pollinators. We were speaking of bees and how they have, we've heard of this, this term called pollinator collapse syndrome or something. That's all bees that have been, have been killed by pesticides in the area. And we, we really want to turn that around too and see if we can um, bring, bring them back fully so that they can do their job of pollinating. And um, so it says the insecticides weaken a, bee, a bee's immune system, forager bees bring pesticide laden pollen and nectar back to the hive. And six, six months later, the bees fall prey to natural bee infection. So anyway, we want to, change, we want to change. Yep. I'm sorry, yes, we want to turn that around too. So I thank you very much for, for uh, presenting this time for me to share and others as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Are there any questions? All right, seeing none. Thank you for your testimony. And uh, next is Andrew Hackman. Good morning, Senator Dill, Representative Neal, members of the Agriculture Conservation and Forestry Committee. My name is Andrew Hackman, a resident of Union representing True Green Lawn Care here in opposition to LD 1158. I would certainly echo some of the issues that the department noted in terms of the breadth and scope of, of this legislation. Certainly heard some comments relative to potential to amend the legislation, but speaking just specifically to the text that's in the language is currently uh, structured, it would prohibit all synthetic pesticides in all applications. There is no other state in the nation uh, and I would also note in terms of relevance to the ordinances that have been discussed uh, today, this differs even significantly from ordinances that are in place in, in most of the towns uh, here in Maine. So this is a complete and blanket ban of all synthetic pesticides. It uh, ignores integrated pest management practices. All of True Green's certified applicators go through extensive training after year with the department and the Board of Pesticides Control to ensure that they are using the least toxic material, whether that's organic or synthetic, as their first course of action. And it is something that we believe strongly in and, and practice extensively, and uh, believe that this legislation, at least as currently drafted, uh, would significantly hinder the ability to prevent things such as brown tail moth, uh, address 
uh, insects that, that destroy homes and have significant property damage uh, for Maine citizens and folks that need to, to protect their property. Uh, and, and just wanna speak to, to the breadth and scope and unprecedented nature of the current structure of this legislation. So I'll, I'll stop my comments there, but again, Andy Hackman, on behalf of Truking Lawn Care, recommend that the committee uh, vote ought not to pass on LD 1158. Thank you. Are there any questions? All right, seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Uh, next up is Anthony Arahan, followed by Bob Mann, Christopher Finarelli, and Curtis Picard. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Senator Dill, Representative O'Neill, and esteemed members of the ACF Committee. Thank you for the opportunity to speak this morning in opposition to LD 1158. My name is Anthony Howard, and I am representing both Irving Woodlands and Maine Northern Railway Company here this morning. This bill would essentially take all the advances in science and technology developed for pest control in the last 40 years away from everyone that's not involved in farming in Maine. If I wear my forester's hat, we lease we lose the use of important herbicides being used to ensure healthy forest regeneration, used to combat the ever-growing list of invasive plant species in the state, and eliminating these tools can lead to these invasives impacting our forests, our lands, and interrupting natural ecosystems, not to mention that some of these invasives create public safety issues. Then we need to factor in the possible insects that we lose tools to combat outbreaks of. It's been mentioned the brown tail moth is one, spruce budworm is another one that's uh, high on our radar as we're seeing uh, populations increase in Arusta County, gypsy moth, emerald ash borer, to name but a few. So these tools are not only important in farming, but in general land management. If I switch to my railway hat, which I won't because I've heard uh, Senator Dill say we can't use props in the past. Uh, if I think of the Northern Railway, limiting these tools create big issues for them as well. Today, these tools are used to keep the railroad tracks clear of brush and grasses. If these are not controlled, it becomes a loading of fine fuels stretching for hundreds of miles across the state. Many are looking to reduce carbon emissions associated with transportation by utilizing more freight rail. Well, steel wheels traveling over steel rails create sparks that can ignite these fuels and cause fires, putting people, communities, and forests at risk. Let's not push Maine towards the realities of poor undeveloped parts of the world when we have tested and approved tools to deal with pests like biting insects that could carry diseases like malaria and Zika, diseases carried by fleas and ticks and highly effective tools that can be used to land stewardship. Banning responsible use of these tools that this bill says are okay to use in the production of food, but not for other uses to protect people, animals, and forests would be irresponsible. So again, I urge you to vote ought not to pass on LD 1158. And thank you for your time this morning. Thank you. Are there any questions? Representative McCray. You're muted, Representative. Too, too okay. many buttons, too many buttons to get in here to raise your hand and to speak. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good morning, Mr. Horahan. Uh, you, you probably can clear something up. We've talked before, but I, I'm just curious. This, see, this bill uh, says to for non-agricultural use. And in some, in some venues, I hear your industry uh, talk about the modern forestry industry is, is farming trees in a sense, okay? Is there a difference between, uh, this looks at non-agricultural, does your company consider themselves agriculture, non-agricultural, or just forestry? Well, we refer to forestry, but uh, I think we as foresters uh, think of ourselves as farmers of the forest, but over a much longer rotation than, than an annual crop. But uh, I think by the definition of what's in the bill, uh, we would not be considered part of the agricultural sector or the, or the farm products. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I suspected that, but thank you for clarifying that. Are there other questions? All right, seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Next is Bob Mann. 
Thank you, Senator Dill. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I am uh, Bob Mann. I'm with the National Association of Landscape Professionals, and thank you very much for taking the time to listen to me this morning. I refer to you to the uh, written testimony that I submitted earlier this morning. However, I, I find myself in uh, agreement with Representative Collins when he uh, referred this morning that he would like to defer more to the, uh, the expertise of the Board of Pesticide Control. And I think that any time that I've come to in front of this committee and, and, and heard someone from the Board of Pesticide Control, whether it's Maggie Patterson or, or uh, in this case, uh, Ian Gibbs this morning, I'm impressed by the level of expertise that they bring to the subject uh, in an impartial way. And uh, I, 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 I worry that the, the committee and, and, and the state in general is actually heading in the wrong direction with this, that we have a, a, a set of pesticide products that's, that uh, are, are registered by the Environmental Protection Agency. They're available in 50 states that are universally beneficial or toxic or anywhere in between that you are allowing at the municipal level to be either banned or not banned. It would be much better. I, I'm sure that the committee is, is tired of talking about this topic endlessly, that you would have a single uh, you know, preemptive legislation in place in the state of Maine that would allow the Board of Pesticide Regulations to be the only body in the state that regulates pesticides instead of having a mishmash of regulations that are different from one jurisdiction to the other. The prohibition approach that's um, that's outlined here has many uh, un uh, unintended consequences that we've been able to identify by looking at this type of um, this type of legislation in other jurisdictions and other states. With the with the removal of effective pesticide products, customers of lawn and landscape com com uh, companies will cancel their services. The imposition of a ban on lawn care pesticides in Montgomery County, Maryland, only a year ago, has resulted in catastrophic losses to business. The failure of lawn pesticides uh, licensed pesticide application businesses that provide these important services is the only logical outcome of a bill such as this. Pests, on the other hand, don't care about politics and will continue to persist. Without EPA registered pesticides available and professional applicators to apply them, consumers will take to performing clandestine applications of pesticides themselves. Consumers do not have the training or the expertise that is required of professional applicators, and the chances of uh, misapplication are greatly increased, the exact thing that this bill purports to alleviate. Because there are no professional applicators available, black markets will inevitably develop. We see this in Montgomery County already. These bootleg applications will be performed by unlicensed, untrained, uninsured, rogue applicators that do not answer to the Board of Pesticide Control. Because there are no re records of the applications, we will have no idea what was applied or if it was applied correctly. State and municipal budgets, already stretched then, do not have the resources to properly deal with such infractions. In summation, this bill takes what is today a highly regulated industry, destroys it, and replaces it with a completely unregulated black market. Thank you very much for your time. Happy are to entertain any, any questions. Are there any questions? All right, seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Next is Christopher Finarelli. Thank you, Chair Dill, uh, Co-Chair O'Neill, members of the committee, really appreciate the opportunity to testify today. Uh, Christopher Finarelli with the Household and Commercial Products Association, respectfully here in opposition to the measure today. Um, ACPA is the premier association representing the interest of companies engaged in the manufacture and sale of familiar consumer products to help household uh, customers create cleaner and healthier environments. Um, pesticide products allow Maine residents and all communities the ability to clean and protect their homes and workplaces with safe products. We would align our concerns with some of those expressed already in terms of the scope of the bill. The term pesticide encompasses a number of products uh, such as disinfectants, sanitizers, insect repellents, insecticides, herbicides, and rodenticides, among other products. Many of these products uh, rely on technology that is formulated or manufactured by a chemical process and would meet the definitions outlined in this bill. These products uh, have always been important to the safety of residents in Maine, but in recent months, they have been even more critical due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Disinfectants, particularly those on the Environmental Protection Agency's list N, which is the list of disinfectants that EPA expects to uh, kill the COVID-19 virus 
have been uh, crucial in protecting consumers and workers. Uh, other restricted products would include insect repellents that ensure fewer bug bites and less exposure to bug uh, derived illnesses. Main residences rely on insecticides to keep insects out of their homes and herbicides to keep the plants and grass from growing weeds. When used properly, pesticides uh, protect humans, pets, plants, homes, and workplaces from pests. The safety of consumers is the highest priority for HCPA members. Um, I'll, just, I'll just conclude real quickly here that this committee has done a, a great deal of work on pesticides. We've been um, a, a, a partner in that, um, but I think it's important to underscore the basics um, in, in, in response to the scope of the bill. Um, in the absence of pest management or insufficient pest management, um, that can bring its own health risks, uh, including viruses and bacteria, insects, such as cockroaches or rodents, which can present health issues or contamination of food, for example. Um, we, we believe it's important to recognize that integrated pest management is an exercise in managing risk. So not just by any presented by a particular pesticide product, uh, but also from the pest of concern. I really encourage the committee to consider those uh, health risks on both sides. Uh, for, for these reasons and more ACPA respect to pose this measure, happy to take any questions. Are there any questions? All right, thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Uh, next is Curtis Picard, followed by Don Flannery, Elizabeth Frazier, and Jeremy Legassi. Uh, good morning, Senator Dill, Representative O'Neill, and members of the Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry Committee. My name is Curtis Picard, and I'm President and CEO of the Retail Association of Maine. I'm also a resident of Topsom. We have more than 350 members statewide and represent retailers of all sizes, and Maine's retailers employ more than 85,000 Mainers. I'm testifying in opposition to LD 1158. Although LD 1158 does not specifically ban the sale of synthetic pesticides, it might as well be a sales prohibition. It would prevent residents from applying any synthetic pesticides on their property except those related to agriculture. Maine has thousands of registered pesticides. I believe the number is greater than 12,000 products. How many of those products would now essentially be banned under LD 1158? Perhaps the Maine Board of Pesticide Control can provide a list of affected products under this proposal. Further, we are not aware of any state in the country that has also banned the application of pesticides. Uh, these are products that are already reg regulated in Maine by the board and proper education, best practices and sound application methods work well. We urge the committee to reject LD 1158. Thank you for your time this morning and I'm happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions? Thank you for your testimony. Next is Don Flannery. Good morning, Senator Dill, Representative O'Neill. I'm Don Flannery, uh, Maine Potato Board, Executive Director of Maine Potato Board. Uh, I won't take much of your time this morning as this is going along uh, quite long, I know. Uh, we're op in opposition to this bill for a couple of reasons. One is we understand this isn't about agriculture right now but we're always concerned about these bills and where they're headed and what they're doing as is to the next step and uh, if agriculture should be included in them. <clears throat> One thing I'd like for the committee to consider is that this talks about synthetic pesticides. And I guess my concern is, or our concern is, does that mean that uh, we, we believe that all other pesticides are, are uh, safe and don't have an impact on the environment? <clears throat> and I think you heard, uh, and Gibbs from the department talked this morning about some such as copper and sulfur and some of those others. So, you know, when you're talking about the impact or the, on the environment and health, I think you've got to look at a broad spectrum, the broad spectrum of pesticides, uh, not narrow it down just in, to synthetic pesticides. And then the other uh, concern on this bill, <clears throat> which is a real concern to ours, is the Board of Pesticide Controls. And uh, I think... Uh, I've been in, the, uh, in this job for 25 years, I guess. And uh, you've heard me say in the past that we haven't always agreed with the Board of Pesticide Controls, but we've always had a lot of faith in what they do. I think they're very credible in what they do. And I think those that have served on that board now and in the past have done an excellent job. And one thing the committee should consider is that every time there's a vacancy, 
or someone has term has expired and they're up to be renewed as a member of that board of pest site control, ACF has the ability uh, for a confirmation hearing or does a confirmation hearing for those individuals. So I think that would be the opportunity for any concerns that any uh, anybody had uh, in the general public and on the committee to voice those concerns and get questions answered. So with that, I won't take any more of your time, uh, but be glad to answer any questions. Thank you. Our Representative Schofield. <clears throat> Thank you, Senator Dill. Thank you, Don, for being here this morning. It was alluded to earlier by one of the previous folks uh, who testified that there was some uh, collusion or some uh, some uh, benefit some benefit derived from folks on the pesticide control board and the regulators and those who are regulated. In your decades of experience dealing quite closely with this, these folks, have you ever seen anything that you would call into question as far as their uh, credibility or, or their uh, honesty in dealing with those who are being regulated? Thank you. Um, none that come to the top of my head, Representative Schofield. Uh, you know, I there's been times we haven't agreed and been concerned with some of the members on there that the positions are taken or the stance they're taking. But, and, you know, as Ann laid out earlier that, uh, you know, each member on that board represents a particular sector. And obviously their interest is in that sector, whatever it may be. So you expect that there's going to be some, you know, concern as to uh, something that's being done and they have a, more of an interest in one side or the other. Uh, but I think overall uh, in all of my years and uh, I think they've done a tremendous job. I really do. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, seeing none. Thank you. Uh, Elizabeth Frazier. Good morning. <clears throat> we can hear me okay. Yes. Great. Uh, Senator Dill, Representative Newton Neal, and members of the Agriculture Conservation Forestry Committee. My name is Elizabeth Frazier. I'm an attorney at Pierce Atwood based in Portland and Augusta. And I'm before you this morning on behalf of Scott's Miracle Grow. Um, I've spoken to this committee before about Scott's, but I always like to remind you that there is actually a Scott's plant here in Maine, up in Medway, uh, that works on a lot of things, including uh, fertilizer and components of uh, organic fertilizer. So I just always like to remind the committee of that. I think you've heard a lot this morning um, that's mirrored in my written testimony, which I would direct you to, about how the legislation that's proposed is overbroad, uh, I think unclear, and uh, frankly unnecessary uh, because of regulation that already exists. Uh, but I also did wanna to touch on something that I don't think uh, we've heard as much about this morning. I think there's been a lot of talk about, you know, what I would call sort of weed lawn and other uh, types of controls, but, but not as much about insect pests, uh, which this uh, bill would also prohibit the sale of insect pesticides um, for our homes and for individuals to manage pests that may be in their home, including bed bugs, cockroaches, etc. I was thinking about this testimony last night and I never do this, but I very quick personal story because I thought, what the heck would I have done if this had happened to me? I lived in, uh, this was in Hampshire was a couple of years ago and I had this terrible apartment, you know, I was 21 and it was basically infested with household centipedes. And if you've ever had household centipedes and you're not a fan of insects like me, that's very bad situation. Uh, so off we went to the hardware store to get the uh, the insect pesticide, which was very effective. Uh, and we, you know, of course, applied it according to the label, um, which is very important. But I, I thought of that story and I thought, geez, you know, I would not have been able to, to deal with that on my own. I would have had to call someone at great expense, um, which was money I didn't really have to deal with this problem. So that's just an example of how uh, the bill would impact manners. I think with respect to the um, overbroadness and, and other language in the bill, you've already heard enough about that, so I won't repeat it. Uh, again, I did submit written testimony and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have for me this morning. Thank you, are there any questions? All right, again, Fantastic. thank you for your testimony. Thank you so much. Uh, next 
is Jeremy Lagasse, followed by Julianne Smith, Patrick Strout, and Patrick Valencourt. Good morning. Uh, I'll do my best to try not to sound so robotic here, but uh, I'm going to read this. Uh, Senator Dill, Representative O'Neill, and members of the Joint Standing Committee of Agriculture and Conservation and Forestry, I respectfully oppose LD 1158 as it as a business owner who employs on average 12, uh, 13 to 22 annually, the impact on businesses like ours and their families will be devastating. I'm a licensed commercial applicator for over 20 years. I've been a commercial applicator for over 28 years. Our business has provided sustainable outdoor pest management services to residents for over 34 years. As a member of the green industry, we all love our environment. We enjoy being outside. We enjoy learning about Mother Nature and all of the many plants, animals, and insects that are part of it. We enjoy our children and grandchildren having the opportunity to be in the great state of Maine and learn and grow in our environment with all it has to offer. As an Eagle Scout, I learned to appreciate nature and to always leave it better than we found it. Eliminating pesticides within the state of Maine has do too broad of a stroke. The Maine Board of Pesticide Control uh, control established in 1965 is the existing body of our state that regulates the use of pesticides. The citizens and professionals on the board are well-educated and responsible individuals. We can all agree that reducing the use of pesticides is a positive thing and integrated pest management already achieves this. When pests become a problem, IPM is the methodology that we must employ to manage these concerns. It is a well thought out series of activities that puts pesticides and their use last. Eliminating the use of pesticides removes the last line of defense against sometimes poisonous and life-threatening pests. The many pests that invade our forest, athletic fields, golf courses, public areas, home and landscapes are not going away. Why are we considering eliminating a tool that is regulated federally and locally with years of data and testing that is deemed safe when used uh, appropriately following label instructions? Ignoring the stories of thousands of Mainers who have had adverse reactions to poisonous and invasive species in our state is dangerous and very concerning. As a new business owner, I am of course against this. We understand and respect the views of those who wish to do away with all pesticides. There is a middle ground that, and there is middle ground always, and that should be where efforts are focused. Moving forward with LD uh, 1158, as it is written, will immediately destroy hundreds, if not thousands of businesses within the state. Connected to that would be passionate individuals who are employed by these companies and their families. There is already a governing body that has the responsibility to restrict and regulate the use of these materials. It would be a colossal waste of taxpayer dollars to vote for this, as it is in sidestep this virtually uh, ver vitally important governing body. Children wash their hands with disinfectants we clean our counter countertops, trash areas, bathrooms, et cetera. During the past year, schools have had to be disinfected and sanitized regularly. Were these janitors and school teachers and parents happy about using these products? These products are pesticides. I oppose this piece of less legislation for the safety of our customers, our families, businesses, and schools. This is a massive overstep and I see no effort to produce the facts that already exist from the EPA. There needs to be an effort to bring real evidence and fact-based decision-making to this legislation. So the ripple effects of this will be far-reaching and I see no consideration consideration for this as it is presented. Thank you for your time. Thank you, any questions? All right, so I think none, thank you for your testimony. And next up is uh, Julianne Smith. Uh, there you are. Good morning, Senator Dill, Representative O'Neill, and distinguished members of the Joint Standing Committee on Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry. My name is Julianne Smith, and I am the Executive Director of the Maine Farm Bureau Association, the state's largest farmer-run advocacy organization. We've represented the voice of all agriculture in Maine since 1951, and I'm grateful to have the opportunity to serve as the voice of our farmers today to oppose LD 1158. Maine Farm Bureau represents farmers that have fed our neighbors for 70 years. We've been able to accomplish this arduous task through improvements in technology, education, and production methods. One of the most important improvements to food production has been the development of synthetic pesticides. This has been an important tool for home gardeners as well. This bill's mandate to ban persistent synthetic pesticides is confusing. All pesticides are persistent to some degree. If they were not, they would not provide effective control. 
Yeah, all pesticides do degrade over time, some rapidly, others over extended periods. Ambient air, plant and soil temperatures, as well as moisture, sunlight, and countless other factors affect the persistence of pesticides in the environment. How rapidly must a chemical degrade before it may no longer be regarded as persistent and under what conditions? This bill defines synthetic, but it does not define persistent, rendering the term persistent synthetic pesticides problematic. Even though the term synthetic is defined, its meaning is still unclear. The bill seems to say that a synthetic substance is one that is formulated by a process that chemically changes a natural substance, unless it doesn't. If this definition becomes law, we question what products, if any, will be available for pest control in the state of Maine. With a six-fold increase in the cases of Lyme disease in Maine in the past decade, this is a very dangerous proposition. A little clarity here would be welcome. While this bill allows for the use of persistent synthetic pesticides in agriculture, it does not allow for them in forestry. This is a concern for farmers as a significant amount of land on Maine farmlands is woodland. Farmers may need to protect their forest crops from insects, disease, and invasive species, just as they do for their agricultural crops using the same types of pesticides. Equally dangerous is the implication in section two of this bill that the current members serving on the Board of Pesticides Control do not equitably represent public environmental and industry interests and have financial conflicts of interest. Implied accusations like these should only be brought forward with substantiated data. Since its inception in 1965, the composition of the Board of Pesticides Control has been reviewed repeatedly over many sessions of the Maine State Legislature, yet it has changed very little since 1979. In 79, the board moved from a composition of commissioners to a technical expertise board whose members were appointed by the governor. The board is presently well-balanced with three PhDs, one MD, two public members, and a pesticide applicator, all of whom have a wealth of knowledge of the safe and proper use of pesticides. All present members have been nominated by governor, vetted by this committee, and confirmed by the Senate. None of the present board members have been accused of financial conflict of interest. The board's composition has stood the test of time has worked well and no evidence has been presented that it should be changed. Can you finish up conclude, please? Certainly. We respectfully urge the committee to vote ought not to pass. And I thank you for your time and would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Uh, Representative Schofield. You're muted, Representative. I'm sorry, thank you. I'm like, like Representative McCray, I have too many buttons to push, I guess. Uh, I'm wondering if, uh, Ms. Smith, if you could expand upon that. I, I had some concerns when I heard earlier testimony that there was, it was alluded that alluded to that the Pesticides Control Board was some, somehow under some influence by those who were being regulated. And could you expand on that and, and give us your thoughts on, on, on that whole subject? I started in this position in 2017. I have attended almost every Board of Pesticide Control meeting um, since that time. I have never seen any evidence of a conflict of interest. These people do use pesticides in their jobs. I, and I think that's an important component. How could you possibly comprehend the challenge of whether a pesticide should be approved or not for use if you have no investment in it. I mean, this is a tech, technical expertise board. This isn't a public opinion board. Thank you so very much. Are there other questions? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Patrick Straub. Thank you, Senator Dill and Representative O'Neill and distinguished members of the ACF committee. I'm Patrick Strauch from Exeter, Maine, executive director of the Maine Forest Products Council. We uh, strongly oppose LD 1158 because forestry uses of pesticides are critical in our minds. Um, trees have weeds. Um, just like in agriculture, we need to treat uh, to make sure our crop trees are growing. Uh, just like corn, we focus on the early years, in our case, versus weeks of development. And uh, we, we treat a crop that needs this kind of uh, intervention in the early years, but it's a rotation of about 40 to 70 years that we deal with. So either once or twice during 40 to 70 years, we use this kind of integrated pest management technique. So. 
pesticides can't be banned um, in, in forestry applications. We know that uh, they can produce phenomenal growth. Decades of, of research around the world prove this. In our own backyard, we have an Austin Pond study uh, which looked at northern Maine, and we clearly demonstrated the important role herbicides play in forest production. We've done a number of wildlife studies in those areas as well. Invasive plants are growing in the forestry sector. Uh, we need herbicides in order to deal with those. We've heard of some of the traditional beech bark diseases, uh, other diseases coming our way, and this new phenomena of blue lettuce. Um, I don't I don't think we'll get to the point where we can eat it, but it certainly is a terrible uh, um, plant that's taking over some of our areas. And we need to keep in mind spruce budworm is uh, an insect that we've traditionally tried to manage. We have some, it'll be a very different kind of spruce budworm approach um, as we deal with spruce budworm going forward. It'll be more targeted. There won't be large broadcast applications, but we need to keep our tools for dealing with in insects open, and spruce budworm is certainly a big threat that's starting to uh, percolate. So we recognize the responsibility of dealing with these chemicals. The, the committee authorized an audit that uh, I think demonstrated we have nothing to hide. We take the training, uh, the regulations, and the BMPs very seriously and are willing to stand the test of folks scrutinizing them. With regards to the Board of Pesticide Control, um, we think the process allows a lot of vetting. The governor has to approve of this technical group of people. Um, you as a legislative body are involved. Uh, and we think that that's an appropriate kind of oversight of this group of folks that need to show some technical uh, expertise. So there's oversight. <clears throat> We don't think there for we don't believe the proposed language to identify any appearance of financial conflict of interest is required. These folks are professional and they understand them, the job that they have ahead of them. Thank so you. the council urges you to vote out not to pass on LD 1158. And I appreciate the opportunity to uh, present this information. Representative Thank Craig. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I got my buttons all in order. Uh, Thank you for being here, Mr. Trout. Uh, sure. I'm going to ask you pretty much the same question that I asked Mr. Horahan. Uh, looking at it, do, does your organization consider uh, forestry to be agriculture or something defined slightly less? Uh, no, if you look at, uh, you know, where we reside in the federal government, uh, the U.S. Forest Service is under the USDA. So at some level that is recognized. And I myself have a master's degree in silviculture and that's the art and science of tending a crop of trees. So there are a lot of similarities. The timelines are different, but we're managing soil, we're managing crops, we're trying to put um, uh, uh, the most growth on selected crop trees going forward. So a lot of parallels there. So it'd be curious not to include forestry in uh, an exemption for agriculture. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions? All right, seeing Thank none, you. I will move on to Patrick Valencourt followed by Catherine Spovera. Good morning, everyone. Senator Dill, Representative O'Neill, and members of the Joint Standing Committee on ACF. My name is Patrick Valancourt. I'm the owner operator of Northern Turf Management, especially Turf, Plant Healthcare, and Pest Company in Sear Plantation, Maine. I am opposed to LD1158. I've been in the turf and ornamental healthcare industry since 2012 with a BS degree in horticulture from UMaine and an AS degree in turf management from UMass Amherst. You've heard from me uh, on several bills lately. I was trying to think of how not to harp on the critical points I've made in my previous testimony in recent bills like this, but honestly, they weren't being mentioned yet again. Pesticides are simply a tool in our toolbox to solving pest problems. By practicing IPM, they are a last resort, but we need to have them as that last resort. All pesticides that are registered for use in the U.S. and in Maine are reviewed and approved by the U.S. EPA, an unbiased agency that evaluates materials and makes decisions based on scientific facts. 
There is no emotion, fear, or personal bias involved. It's been mentioned before that the science the EPA follows is not the proper science. If that were true, the U.S. as a whole would have a lot more issues than we do. Another point I'd like to make is it seems whenever there is a call to ban this pesticide or restrict that one, the turf and outdoor pest industries seem to always be the target. I'm not entirely sure why, but let's for a second transition our thoughts to other pesticides that are part of our daily lives. Disinfectants that are used to clean our homes and businesses, especially this past year with the explosion of people, both trained and untrained, licensed and unlicensed, using electrostatic sprayers to clean high touch areas in response to COVID. This is great in concept, we need this, but we don't hear any pushback or talks of banning those pesticides, even as unlicensed folks go about blasting them inside every structure in the country. How about your swimming pool? How many millions of gallons of algaecide, chlorine and the like are dumped into backyard swimming pools and public pools alike without a second thought? What about structural pests? The next time you walk into a restaurant, doctor's office, or even your child's school, think about it being infested with rodents, cockroaches, bed bugs. Without pest management professionals practicing IPM and the judicious use of pesticides, those infestations are a guarantee. The point I'm trying to make is pesticides are more a part of your daily life than you think and a necessary part. Finally, a major implication of a bill like this and any bill that restricts pesticides for that matter is the inevitable increase in unlicensed misapplication. While there are always businesses that will engage in such behavior, the added impact of more homeowners doing this would be staggering. I see it on a regular basis as part of my work. I'm called in to fix a lawn problem or a pest problem. And one of the first questions I ask is, what did you apply yourself? The answer nine times out of 10 is, well, X didn't work the first time. So I applied some more. And then when that didn't work, I applied double what the bag said of Y. This is reality. And if you restrict the ability of licensed trained applicators, it will only get worse. People will not stop applying pesticides to their own property and I'd welcome any regulatory body to try and enforce that. People will order the products online, go to a neighboring state to purchase them, or get it from the farmer down the road. Can Just think. Up a second sentence yeah. or two, please. Just think, Grandma applying undiluted paraquat to weeds in her flower garden with shorts and sandals and no PPE. So to close, if you are interested in a free for all of untrained and licensed people making misapplications of pesticides, guaranteed to be not labeled rates or on labeled sites and without BPC oversight, I urge you to pass this as is. Otherwise, vote ought not to pass and let the BPC continue to do a great job regulating pesticide use in Maine. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Schofield. Thank you, Senator Dell. And thank you for being here. Uh, I've heard you before and I'm uh, very impressed with your background. I, I just couldn't help but think, I was in Southern Maine the other day and I was, I was uh, thinking about as I was driving along with some of these pine trees beside the road after the winter winter surface treatment of all of these roads and asphalt parking lots and whatnot down that way, which there are considerable, uh, the effect of uh, you know calcium chloride and all of the stuff that we treat our road surfaces with, uh, which I suspect gets into uh, the soil and lasts a long time. And you, you, you mentioned some other things. What are your thoughts on something like that? Is that, is that something that, uh, that, that we don't seem to worry as much about as we perhaps should? Your thoughts? Sure. I mean, you know, calcium chloride, uh, rock salt, you know, that we, we put on our food, uh, you know, that goes down on the roads and makes the roads safe. And we need to do that. Of course, they're not pesticides, but I mean, they have some similar implications, you know, on our plants, uh, lawns, trees, et cetera. Um, you know, what's the cost of replacing plants, uh, you know, trees, shrubs, flowers, turf every year, just because of road salt, which we, you know, as a necessary part of everyday life in the winter in Maine. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's just one of a whole host of things that, yeah, they may not be pesticides or they may be, but we don't give a lot of them a second thought, you know, and some of these pesticides, pesticides they are, that we use, you know, or controlling pests, uh, you know, invasive things, the list goes on, you know, that's always, oh, we got to ban this, got to ban this. Well, you know, how, how is it different than things like that? I, I, it's not. Thank you. Uh, are there any other questions? Uh, Representative Underwood. Yes, Mr. Valancourt. What are uh, some of the other uses of pesticides other than agriculture in Aroostook County, for example, like land management companies, forests, golf, course, golf courses, et cetera, so forth. 
Thank sure. You. So, I mean, you know, a golf course is number one, uh, you know, find, finally maintain turf. Uh, golf courses provide, you know, how much revenue as an industry to the state enjoyment. Uh, you know, lawn care, of course, yes, and it's not all cosmetic. You know, we're controlling pests so that people have a lawn and don't have just bare soil, uh, you know, invasive weeds, um, you know, tick control, mosquito control, all of these are disease, disease, they vector disease. Um, so, you know, forest, managing forest lands, as has been mentioned before, uh, roadside vegetation management, you know, if we were to manage the vegetation on our state roadsides, I used to be a contractor that managed vegetation on roadsides for the state. Um, if we were to manage all that vegetation that we do with chemical controls by mechanical cutting, it's a 60 to one cost factor. And that's directly from Maine DOT. So, you know, you think we have money problems now, just any one of these things, you know, think if we take away pesticides. Um, I mean, I could go on, but that's, that's a small list. Are there any other questions? Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Catherine Soberall. Thank you, Senator Dill, uh, Chair uh, Representative O'Neill and members of the committee. My name is Catherine Soberall and I'm the Executive Director of the Maine Veterinary Medical Association. And as a representative of the Maine Veterinary Medical Association, I am testifying neither for nor opposed to LD 1158. Uh, the MVMA is concerned that the bill unintentionally includes animal flea and tick treatments in its definition of persistent synthetic pesticides. Flea and tick treatments are essential not only for animal health, but also for public health and the prevention of vector-borne diseases. Lyme disease is not the only disease that can be carried by deer ticks in Maine. Um, Maine CDC also lists ana anaplasmosis and a host of other diseases um, that, that deer ticks carry. Uh, providers report human cases of, all of these diseases or they reported them in 2020 and they're all a public health concern. Beyond flea and tick products, we are concerned that other products used to treat animals could also unintentionally be included in the current bill. Um, for example, oral anti-parasitic products that are used in a wide variety of veterinary settings. Uh, we have spoken to uh, the sponsor of the bill about our concerns and um, he was open to adjustments um, that this, and this was unintentional. Um, so if, if the committee decides to move forward with this bill, we just ask that, um, that this issue be considered. Um, thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? All right, seeing none. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Cheryl, that's all I have on my list. Is there anyone else? I, I would ask that you ask the attendee list if there's anyone here to speak because there are some people on there that um, I don't know who they are. Uh, they might be here for the blueberry meeting. Um, okay. Uh, they're just not on my list for that either. <laughs> okay. I just, all right. Is there anyone else? Just raise Seeing your none. hand. Nope. Okay. I will close the hearing on LD 1158. And we will open up the hearing on LD 1159 and act to amend the membership requirements of the Board of Pesticides Control. And that's represented by, uh, presented by Representative Ocean. Oh, hello. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Senator Dill, Representative O'Neill, and members of the Joint Standing Committee on Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry. I am your, uh, your co-member of this committee, Representative Lori Osher from Orno. Thank you for the opportunity to introduce LD 1159, an act to amend the membership requirements of the Board of Pesticide Control. The bill requests to amend the membership requirements such that two public members appointed to the board must have demonstrated interest in environmental protection represent different geographic areas of the state. That requirement that two members have demonstrated interest in environmental protection and represent different geographic areas of the state was previously included in the law, but the wording was changed in 2011 to quote, have experience and knowledge of sustainable management uh, of pests. So removing the emphasis on environmental protection board geographic representation 
The impact of this change was to undermine the core mission of the board. LD 1159 would restore the original intent of the required credentials for the two public members of the Board of Pesticides Control and ensure no conflict of interest. While membership on the board does not exclude, I guess they, that would be an amendment to ensure no contact of in, conflict of interest. While membership on the board does not exclude citizens who will prioritize the health of the ecological systems now, there is no guidance for those making appointments to the board that states demonstrated interest in environmental protection as a priority. In addition, including a restriction on conflict of interest for the public members of the BPC would align with requirements for many boards and commissions of the main state government. The main state boards and commissions definition for, pu for a public member is a person who has no financial interest in the profession regulated by the board to which that member has been appointed and who has never been licensed, certified, or given a permit in this or any other state for the occupation or profession that member is appointed to regulate. That's Title V, uh, occupational, uh, Title V, 12004A, Occupational and Professional Licensing Boards. It is appropriate that the BPC's public members should have a demonstrated interest in environmental protections and should never have been employed in the manufacture distribution, sale, promotion, or commercial application of pesticides. Maine citizens appear to have lost faith in the BP BPC's management of pesticides use and are seeking more restriction on use of pesticides than the BPC. Evidence of this includes the large number of pesticide related bills we hear in this committee and the increasing number of municipal ordinances banning or regulating pesticide use and sales. The Board of Pesticides Control is by Maine statute tasked with finding ways to minimize reliance on pesticides to control targeted pest populations. Specifically, the statute says that it shall promote the principles and implementation of integrated pest management and other science-based technology to minimize reliance on pesticides. That's MSRA 22-1471-X. With a requirement that environmental advocates have seats on the board's table, at the board's table, membership of the BT, BPC, oh, excuse me, without the requirement that there are these seats at the board's table, the membership of the BPC has shifted. To citizens with interest in pesticide regulation for public health and environmental protection, the BPC is now seen as having been captured by the industry that it regulates and is no longer meeting the goals of the statute that created it. It is our job as members of the Joint Standing Committee on Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry to correct this shift in the BPC that has occurred since the requirement for environmental advocates was removed in 2011. LD 1159 would improve the decision-making and accountability of the Board of Pesticides Control. In order to bring membership requirements back into compliance with the board's governing statute, I request that you vote ought to pass with an amendment to include a restriction on conflict of interest for the public members, for these two public members. Thank you. Are there any questions? Representative Hall. Yes, thank you, Senator Dale. And thank you, uh, Representative Osha, for bringing this uh, forward. Could you give us more in-depth detail about uh, why there is less um, uh, belief that, more belief that there's incompetency of the Board of Pesticides Control, because I don't know, we, we seem to hear both sides of it. So I don't know, I would like to hear more of why, what you're thinking there. Uh, thank you for your uh, question. Uh, I didn't ever use the word incompetency. That's pretty strong. I, I think that we all understand uh, when we look at, at the world that when we have people at the table that represent diversity, then we end up having a discussion at that table uh, that represents the diversity of opinions. And when the board's sh uh, requirements of who was on sitting around that table shifted, uh, that we know that that means that there's that there might be less diversity. Uh, we uh, have the requirement there be a, a medical person and a requirement to be somewhere within university. And that's because we understand that they have a unique perspective uh, that they bring to this discussion of pesticide use uh, 
move to the, the, the goal of public health protection and why the doctor, the, the person from the university for 25 years, we've, uh, John Jemison has been, and his specialty is looking at uh, agricultural agronomic systems. Uh, he's uh, focuses on integrated pest management, organic um, agriculture. And uh, so we have some people at the table that are focusing on integrated pest management and public health. However, when the board was, was designed, there were two more spots that were, that were specifically designed to not be people who are in the industry. And now that we don't have that, that means that there's no goal of filling that seat with people who are focusing specifically on the environment without having had a role in the pesticide industry. So uh, I think that the word incompetent is too strong. I think that we're ju I'm just talking about a shift and I'm new to the legislature, but certainly in our public hearings, we've heard a lot of bills about pesticides. Uh, I am a town councilor. There's discussion at the town council uh, level of people concerned about applications. Specifically, the, some of the people who have said they oppose this have said, Oh, if you ch make this change, then there'll be, or to me, the previous, uh, pre the pre previous bill, if you make this change, people at home are just gonna be pour pouring pesticides out because you're not gonna have the application by licensed applicators. I, 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 I don't understand uh, why, why there's a concern. Uh, the, the goal of the best sport of pesticide control is for us, for them to tell us and the state how to best manage pests uh, and, and control pesticide use, uh, manage, reduce, focus on IPM. And the people at the table have to, be, some of them have to be IPM experts, that that's their goal is reducing pesticide use. Where if someone whose job it is, is to sell pesticides or apply pesticides, that's the lens that they're looking through. So that, so this is a, uh, again, as a town counselor, I. I see that municipalities across the state are having these discussions to try to make uh, protect their uh, their citizens, and their concern is that the BPC is not doing that. Uh, as a as a legislator, I'm seeing lots of things that show that uh, our uh, fellow legislators are bringing things up that uh, obviously they're bringing because their constituents are concerned. And so we, our job is to listen to our constituents and do our best to uh, make sure that the boards that we oversee or that we help um, manage, I don't know exactly the, the proper words because I'm new to the legislature, but basically the board pesticide control discussions of it are in our committee because that's our job. And uh, they were formed by a statute that said to focus on IPM. And it appears that the citizenry of our state does not believe that they're actually focusing on IPM as much as they should be. Are there any other questions? Uh, Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Representative Osher, for your testimony and for um, bringing this bill forward. Um, a question that I have, um, not necessarily for you today, I think it's more for our analysts. I'm, I'm wondering if we could get the legislative history on the 2011 change and that analyst sheet that we usually get, just so we could follow um, that history and, and how those changes took place. The work session, was that Representative O'Neill? Yes, please. Okay. That probably can come from the board um, department. I'm okay. requesting it from OPLA, yes. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, thank you for your presentation. Next is Ann Gibbs from the department. Good morning, uh, Senator Dill, Representative O'Neill, and members of the committee. I am Ann Gibbs, speaking neither for nor against LD 1159, an act to amend the membership requirements of the Board of Pesticide Control. The department's Board of Pesticide Control is charged with ensuring public access to the benefits of pesticide use while protecting public and environmental health. The board is further charged with finding ways to minimize reliance on pesticides through promotion of integrated pest management and other science-based strategies for controlling pests. The board's area of oversight and stewardship, pesticide distribution and use, has remained the same since the board was established in 1965. However, demand for these services has steadily increased. 
The current public board is comprised of seven public members appointed by the governor to serve four-year terms. Day-to-day -day activities are carried out by a staff of 10 full-time and four seasonal employees who are housed in the Bureau of Agriculture, Food and Rural Resources within the Division of Animal and Plant Health. LD 1159 proposes to require the two public members on the board to have demonstrated interest in environmental protection and represent different geographic areas of the state. This language, as has been mentioned, is essentially the same language that existed in statute for BPC's public members prior to 2011. Because the board functions successfully and capably utilizing that previous definition, just as it also functions successfully and capably today under the current definition, we do not foresee a concern with reverting to the prior definition. An interest in environmental protection is certainly relevant to effective service on the Board of Pesticide Control. I will be happy to answer your questions um, at this time and will be available at the work session for first, further discussions. Thanks. Are there any questions? All right, seeing none, thank you very much. Next is Heather Spaulding, I think already spoke. She was on her way to get a shot, so I don't think she's here. So next is Julianne Smith and followed by Patrick Strom. Oops, Heather is here. Do you want, do you want to speak Heather on this one? It, if you wouldn't mind, I, I would appreciate it. I, I um, kind of abbreviated in my remarks earlier to focus on 1158, but I do have a few more things I'd like to say about 1159, if that's okay, I'll try to be quick. Sure. Okay, um, thank you so much, um, Senator Jill and Representative O'Neill and members of the ACF committee. Um, I'm fully vaccinated now. Um, really appreciate the opportunity to speak in support of LD 1159 and act to amend the membership requirements of the Board of Pesticides Control. And I want to thank Representative Osher again for um, her leadership on this. Um, I had said in the last hearing that um, we felt like 1158 could be streamlined further by dropping section two in deference to an amended version of um, LD 1159. And we feel that would restore the original intent of the membership credentials of the BPC and also ensure no conflict of interest for the states to public members with demonstrated interest in environmental protection. The interests of commercial applicators already are well represented and we need perspective of citizens who will prioritize the health of ecological systems. Adding a restriction on conflict of interest for the public members of the BPC would align with requirements for many boards and commissions of Maine's state government. Um, here is the common definition for a public member and I'm quoting, for purposes of any occupational or professional licensing boards which have a public member or members, public member means a person who has no financial interest in the profession regulated by the board to which that member has been appointed and who has never been licensed, certified, or given a permit in this or any other state for the occupation or profession that member is appointed to regulate. It's appropriate, no, that was the quotation. It is appropriate that the BPC's public members should have a demonstrated interest in environmental protections and should never have been employed in the manufacture, distribution, sale, promotion, or commercial application of pesticide. We also feel that the scientists from the university should specialize in either agronomy or entomology. Um, I also attend and regularly report on BPC meetings and I witness a recurring frustration for both the staff and the board members. The public has lost trust in the institution and has taken regulation into its own hands, more and more frequently in the form of municipal ordinances. There's a public perception that the BPC prioritizes the interests of the pesticide industry rather than the public and the environment. This is a challenge for all farmers as well, conventional and organic, and we hope that a board will, with well-balanced expertise and opinion will monitor challenges and opportunities. Organic farmers need the public to have faith in the BPC just as much as do conventional farmers. So again, I urge you to support LD 1159, as well as an amended version of 1158. And I'd be happy to answer some questions if you have any. Thank you so much. Are there any questions? Representative O'Neill. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Ms. Falding, for your testimony. Um, I appreciate you raising that um, the idea about um, the conflict language. Um, and my question for the work session is, um, could the analysts come back with um, with other examples of licensing boards where that language is used? And and perhaps, Ms. Falding, um, you have some examples too that that you could provide. But um, I just want to put that out there. Maybe it'll make their work easier too if you could just give those examples or maybe uh, Missy O'Neill can help or something. Okay, thank you, Representative. Okay. Uh, Representative Schofield. Thank you, Senator Dill. I'm just wondering uh, if you had any examples, either anecdotal or otherwise, of conflicts of interest from the board with the board and those who they regulate. You. Do you have anything that you can say that is substantive to us? It would be appreciated. Thank you. Um, yes, I, I, you know, I, I attend meetings every month, and I report to meetings. I actually report with you a summary of the report that I did for all of the meetings in the past year. Um, my feeling is that the consent agreements, the variance requests, um, there's, there's never a no. I mean, it's, it's, uh, there, there's very rarely um, even lively debate about whether very, um, very dangerous pesticides should be giving, given a variance. Um, I'd be happy to send a copy of that report that I did on all of the activities of the last year to you. Um, I guess I would also say that, um, you know, that the original intent of this, of the composition of this board called for two public members with a very specific focus on a demonstrated interest in environmental protection. Um, when that, re when that requirement was eliminated, those I mean, just more generally um, allowed public members, at least one of the seats is promptly filled with a licensed applicator who represented Heather, we've lost you. Heather, we can't hear you. You um, can't hear you. Yeah, just, I don't know what, yeah, okay, can you hear me now? Can hear you now. I'm so sorry about that. I just um, I'm having having trouble with my connectivity. Um, I, what I was going to say quickly is that um, when the, um, the the composition the credentials were changed for the uh, the composition of of the board, where they removed the um, requirement, the public members have a demonstrated interest in environmental protection. Um, one of those seats was promptly filled with a licensed pesticide applicator who has been advocating for pesticide, um, for the pesticide industry and pesticide, um, the, you know, pesticide interests above the public concern about environmental protection. And we feel like that's just an unfair balance. We, the history was that we had a balanced perspective. I think you will hear testimony from another employee of the Board of Pesticides Control who speaks very clearly about this and the, the change in dynamic and the discourse at the board over the years. Um, if you know, these ordinances are not going away, they're only going to increase in number. And we feel that this approach could um, do a lot to restore faith in, in the Board of Pesticide Control. Thank you. Are there other questions? Representative Landry. Uh, yes, thank you, Heather. Uh, when was that change made? Do you know? I think we, I think we might have lost her. Oh well, twenty eleven, I believe. Yeah, there was a change in twenty eleven, but okay. Thank you. Well, she's the not there anymore. Okay. All right. Uh, then we'll move on to Julianne Smith. 
Thank you, Senator Dill, Representative O'Neill, and distinguished members of the Joint Standing Committee on Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry. My name is Julianne Smith, and I am the Executive Director of the Maine Farm Bureau Association, the state's largest farmer-run advocacy organization. We have represented the vo voice of all agriculture in Maine since 1951, and I'm grateful to have the opportunity to serve as the voice of our farmers today to oppose LD 1159. Our opposition to LD 1159 is very similar to our opposition that we presented in LD 1158. Um, I would like to bring to the committee's attention that the purpose and the policy of the Board of Pesticides Control uh, is in statute, is for the purpose of assuring to the public the benefits to be derived from the safe, scientific, and proper use of chemical pesticides while safeguarding the public health, safety, and welfare, and for the further purpose of protecting natural resources of the state. It is declared to be the policy of the state of Maine to regulate the sale and application of chemical insecticides, fungicides, herbicides and other chemical pesticides. This is a technical expertise board. We feel that as we stated earlier, um, the change in 1979, which shifted the composition of the Board of Pesticides Control from the commissioners to um, technical expertise was warranted. We were, if you look back through the history, which I, asked the law library to help me with. Um, there was a lot of concern that was brought forward at that time. And we have found that that change was effective. And the current composition of the Board of Pesticides Control does include people that have a deep concern for environmental protection. The people who are using pesticides on the land do not do so without serious consideration. This is their livelihood. Without proper usage, that land um, would not exist for them to have their jobs. So again, we, we feel that the current composition works very well. It has stood the test of time and we don't feel that any evidence has pre been presented that it should be changed. So we respectfully ask that you vote ought not to pass on this bill and I would be happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions? Representative Schofield. Thank you, Senator Dill. And once again, I, I I just heard again that there's a public perception, a public perception, I think is what was referred to as a lack of veracity or credibility uh, of the of the board. And, and I'd just like to hear your perspective of that. Do you think there is a public perception that the board is not credible? Thank you. I would say that the public that I deal with most often are farmers and farmers do not have that perception. Um, we have many organic farmers as members of Maine Farm Bureau Association. I'm not hearing that from them. I'm not hearing that from our conventional farmers. Um, in terms of the consensus that the board has with variations and other um, votes that they take, they are provided with that evidence long in advance of the meeting and have serious consideration prior to the meeting. So there often isn't a need for in-depth analysis. These are people who are experts who are able to take an issue, analyze it, they're scientists, they know how to do that and they can make a educated vote. Uh, I, I don't see the same perception. I think there is a public perception problem with the use of pesticides in general. I don't think that has to do with the Board of Pesticides Control. Thank you. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, for the work session, I'm requesting um, also that we get um, an overview from the director on, um, on staff and the kind of support provided to decision makers so we can understand. Um, what kind of expertise and support is available? Yep. Any other questions? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Patrick Strout. Thank you. Uh, Senator Deal, Bill, Deal, uh, Representative O'Neill, and uh, distinguished members of the Ag Committee, Pat Strout, Maine Forest Products Council. I think we were. Um, uh, opposing this because I just don't want to keep playing a game of uh, bouncing 
language. And I think it's appropriate to talk about what we're doing before we, we uh, just put it back to the way it was. I think Representative O'Neill's um, search for the history of this is a, is a, a very good um, thing to do for the work session. I think um, like the Land Use Planning Commission, we have to recognize that we wouldn't want to put a person in there that was anti-development, that would not contribute much to the technical nature of the mission of the Land Use Planning Commission. So when we use the word, if we're interpreting demonstrated interest in environmental protection to be environmental advocates, I think there needs to be more discussion about that. So I think the dialogue um, put forward by Representative Osher is really uh, important. I would not just say it's an either or situation. Um, and I think we should, I would recommend to you folks that there be more discussion about how, uh, what the language means and how to put it back into um, how to, whether we should do anything at all to change it. My other recollection is that there was an identified concern at the time about the number of issues that came forward regarding landscaping and in, indoor um, home application. And maybe this was a, uh, the, the, there was a Band-Aid put on this definition to bring that kind of expertise into the Board of uh, Pesticide Control. But that's just, uh, my memory and uh, you can't rely on that. Um, but I would take a look at that and see if that was part of the impetus of, of uh, ch changing that definition around as well. So glad to uh, have further discussions. I think it's a highly sensitive time when we're talking about these issues. Um, and I agree with uh, Julianne Smith that this the purpose of this board is to make sure uh, pesticides are used safely, uh, that they're part of an integrated management process, and that members of that board have to believe in that kind of approach. Thank you. I'd be glad to answer any questions. Are there any questions? All right. Seeing none, is there anyone else? Cheryl? Nope. Nope. Not on my list. Okay, then I'll close the hearing on LD 1159 and act to amend the membership requirements of the Board of Pesticides Control. It's 1115. Y y yes, Laurie. Yeah, just one comment, which is that uh, someone who get, submitted testimony but did not speak was Paul Schlein, who used to work for the Board of Pesticides Control, and his testimony includes some of the summary of the history. Right. So it doesn't mean we shouldn't find someone who, to give us a history for the for the um, work session, but there is some in testimony right now. Thank you. Um, let's take a five minute break. When we come back, Representative O'Neill will be the taskmaster at that time instead of me. And we will do the hearing uh, uh, briefing on the Blueberry Commission. So five minutes, and I know we'll start at 20 after. Thank you.
Cheryl, I'm into the background. What's that? I like Cheryl's background. Why, yes. thank you. I thought the blueberryers would like it too. <laughs> Can you hear me okay in this room? I wonder if I have bad perception. No, you're good. Okay. Perfect. Sometimes I have to move out of here. Um, we have a phone call, uh, someone calling in. If you could let us know who you are so that we can change your name. You're on mic too, Cheryl. Yeah, I was hoping they would hear me. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, do you mind if I let them in so we can try to find out who they are? Sure. I have a, a phone number on my screen. Could you please let me know who you are? This is Marie Emerson. Okay, thank you, Marie. I'm gonna send you back now. Yeah, she's one of the ones that I assume wants to say something. Yes, she is. See, I said five, Representative O'Neill, knowing it would be 10, but if I'd said 10, it would have been 15, so. <laughs> I'm thinking. Do you have an order, Representative O'Neill, that you're going to take these folks in? I do. Um, our agenda for today is um, just first to uh, get an overview um, from Karen about the GOC letter. And then next, we'll hear from Washington County um, delegation, whoever's here to um, talk about the GOC request. And then um, we'll have a presentation from the director and then um, a small grower is also on the agenda too. That's um, Marie Emerson. Did you get my um, Excel on who's signed up? I did not. I would have sent it probably 10, 15 minutes ago. All right, I'll check. There's nine people on there. Oh, so folks have signed up to speak as well. Yes. Yeah, well, I think some of them are commissioners, actually, yep. on the Blueberry Commission, probably. And representatives and senators. Right. All right, let me take a look. All right, this is not... Do you want me to send it to you as a PDF? No, thanks. I just have okay. a lot of windows and I opened a very different Excel. <laughs> okay. It took me a second. All right. All right. Yeah. Thanks for saying that. She. I'll still take folks in the order I listed, and then um, if anyone else would like to, yeah, just let me know who you want. Now sure. send them in. All right. We had intended for this to be more of a kind of briefing and initial start. So.
All right, I'm thinking let's get going in a minute or two. Senator Dill, do we have enough people to start? I don't know if it makes a difference. Or... I, I think you're fine. You started with a quorum. You don't, you just okay. reset. Yeah, so sure. You We're don't okay. need to establish sure. the quorum. Thanks, Karen. All right. Um, so as folks are um, coming back, I guess I'll just, I'll start with, um, an introduction that a year ago, um, the government oversight committee received a request from folks um, in Washington County um, around a year ago. Um, and um, we um, had it hit the committee um, just, a, just a little while ago, but my understanding is the request um, started that long ago. And I'll ask um, Karen to give us an overview of that. Um, but long story short, we thought it was an important conversation to have and, um, and that's after reaching out to folks from the delegation. Um, as the policy committee of jurisdiction, um, ACF has an oversight function. So we understood that this was an important conversation to facilitate um, based on our conversation about the commission that started last term here in ACF. Um, so um, what we suggested when we received this request in, um, in GOC was that we create an oversight meeting in ACF, um, including initial fact finding and, and an opportunity to request more information um, related to what folks have brought to us. And based on what we find here in AG, we can discuss appropriate next steps, such as um, sending tailored questions back to government oversight. So after we conduct our oversight, beginning with this briefing um, and not limited to it, we'll report back to GOC. And at that point, GOC will determine whether a formal review of the commission is required. Um, so before I get started, um, I'll just kind of go through the agenda, which will be first to ask our analyst, Karen, to go through the GOC letter outlining the request. And then we'll bring up um, the Washington, Washington County um, legislative sponsors of the request. Um, and then we'll hear from Director um, Eric Venturini, who um, works with the Wild Blueberry Commission. And um, we have a small grower um, who requested to come and, and articulate some of these concerns. And I see that we have a couple more folks signed up. So depending on how time goes, we might, um, we might do, you know, a few minutes at the end to let everybody else um, come up and speak as well. Um, so Karen, I will pass it off to you to, um, to outline what we got from um, GOC for a request from the committee. Sure, thank you, uh, Representative O'Neill. So um, <clears throat> yeah, as, as you just said, this all started back um, in February of 2020. Um, at the end of February of 2020, um, the chairs of the GOC uh, got this request uh, from the Washington County delegation. And so uh, obviously a couple of weeks later, everything's sort of stopped in its tracks. So more recently this year, um, early March, uh, the chairs of the ACF committee got a letter from the chairs of the government oversight committee, um, just basically asking um, ACF committee, because you're the committee of jurisdiction to kind of uh, provide some feedback and input in this uh, process. But um, the GOC recommended you consider um, some the following actions. So one thing they recommended is that you hold a, me a meeting um, between the ACF chairs and Senator Moore and the other legislative uh, sponsors of the request. And then um, the, the second piece of that was this briefing. Um, 
you know, inviting legislative sponsors of the request and representatives of the Wild Blueberry Commission and its staff to brief the committee and provide relevant documents related to questions uh, posed in the request. And documents can include contracts between the Wild Blueberry Commission and Wild Blueberries of North America, audits of the commission uh, pursuant to Title 36, which is the taxation title, and reports of the commission uh, required under um, the Government Evaluation Act in, in Title III. So we received this letter in early March. They wanted the committee to report back at the end of March, but we were in the middle of um, a lot of work in, in the biennial budget. So we asked if it was okay if we held this briefing and uh, beginning of April and report back to them by the end of April. Um, so that's basically uh, their request in a nutshell. Thanks, Karen. Um, so um, with that, um, something I'm going to read is um, the goals from the original GOC request to frame the conversation um, so that folks can know what was in that request. There were three main questions. Um, those questions were um, first, where does blueberry tax money go? Is the um, Wild Blueberry Commission using Wabana, which is the marketing um, organization to steer it back to themselves and not for marketing? The second question is, um, is the relationship between the industry, the commission, and Wabana, the marketing um, arm, transparent? If not, what specific actions must be taken to ensure that business is conducted in the public realm? And the third question was, who provides oversight of both the commission and Wabana, and is oversight adequate? So those were the um, questions that were first um, initiated in the GOC request back um, in February of last year. Um, and now that we have that framing, I'm going to ask that we invite in any Washington County um, legislators who would like to come in and, um, and outline the request for us and kind of where things stand. Representative O'Neill, would you like them to raise their hands to come in or would you like to call them in? Uh, I'm taking a look. I see Representative Ann Perry. Um, I have Mary. And, oh, and I see Senator Moore at the top there too. If we could invite both of them in, that would be great. Cool. Please. Hi, welcome. <laughs> Good to see you all. Thank you so much, Representative O'Neill. I have with me Will Tool, a Representative Tool, and Representative Alley. We happen to all be here at the Cross Building, so it worked out perfect for us to gather together instead of trying to get everybody connected separately. So that you have the 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 majority over here. Only Representative Perry is is back in Calais, so she's not able to join us today. But thank you, thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, right there. Yeah. Perfect, we have the whole crew. So I'll give you the floor and, and, and let you outline the request and, um, and kind of the general situation for the committee. Okay, um, and as it was outlined briefly a little while ago, last February in 2020, we, we make it a habit with the Washington County delegation to try to meet with our constituents on a Wednesday evening. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, Courtney Hammond of Lynch Hill Farm and Greg Bridges of Callis, who are wild blueberry growers, came and or they requested to meet with us and so we met with them and they expressed their concern about the Washington uh, the Wild Blueberry Commission and Wabana and how whether or not they're being transparent in the manner in which they're handling the tax revenues and the the marketing that is going on with the blueberry industry uh, at the time we were thinking about possibly doing a bill uh, you know asking uh, you know some, for some various requirements of uh, the investigation or a resolve for a study and so forth. But we realized it was very late in the year and we were not gonna be able to get it through in time. And of course we did not predict that it was going to be the pandemic and uh, the whole shutdown of what happened on March the 17th. Um, so I think Representative Toole wanted to make a couple of comments as well. 
Yes, and thank you, Senator Moore, and thank you, Agriculture ACF Committee, Representative O'Neill and Senator Dill. It's a pleasure to be with you today. I do want to pick up with where Senator Moore left off and express that this whole request was driven by industry folks such as Mr. Hammond and Mr. Bridges, who laid out a compelling case for having an investigation and and even before that, having a formalized public hearing where they could express their concerns. I know it's a complicated issue. It's an issue that not all of us fully completely understand. It, it's nothing against any individual in the blueberry industry per se. It's a deep, complicated issue with international trade as part of it and marketing and many different folk parts of the whole blueberry industry coming into play, whether it be small growers or large industrial or what have you. So with that, I, I think that if the, oh, the appropriate way to move forward would be after hearing from the Blueberry Commission, if Mr. Hammond and Mr. Bridges are available, I think they can speak directly to their conversation with us and some of the things that they've encountered and witnessed and foreseen and seen throughout the whole thing. I think it's critical in making a recommendation to GOC that you have that insight and that information going forward. And at some point, I think that's I think that's the next best way to move forward with it, as opposed to doing legislation. Because so many times we put bills in and they turn into this they go down a rabbit hole and <laughs> go nowhere or go somewhere and we're not really sure where how they got how we got to where we were. So I think we want to be thorough before putting a bill forward and try to not have to have a bill if a bill is not needed. But if this investigation results in action that needs to be taken in some form, fashion, or means, then by all means we would entertain putting a bill forward or requesting the GOC bring one forward for next session. So I guess that's that's my impressions of where we're at. And sorry for rambling, but <laughs> I hope that was clear. That's great. That's helpful. And um, and absolutely, we can have a presentation, kind of an overview for the committee of the commission and then invite Mr. Hammond and Mr. Um, Mr. Bridges to come speak. Would um, Representative Valley or Representative Perry like to add anything? The, the only thing I'd have to say is that uh, the uh, Canadian production there is uh, almost uh, 20. It's quite a bit. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's quite a bit. And that's why we want, we, we really are encouraging the marketing of the main wild blueberries right. as opposed to North America wild blueberries. Mm -hmm. And of course, our Canadian neighbors, they have a lot more of um, financial assistance from the government than we have in the States. So it's, uh, that's why it's so critical that we make sure it's transparent and what's being spent right. for marketing is indeed marketing the main wild blueberries. And to do that, we need professional professionals that do this profession. I know that's a redundant thing. <laughs> professionals that do this professionally, as opposed to amateurs and people that kind of know what the concern is but don't know how to take it to the next step yeah i, I would like to add something um this is really a long-standing problem and has uh, a lot to do with cross-border blueberries <laughs> throughout the commission as well as wabana and and we really aren't in a position to evaluate what's happening and what's transparent and what isn't. And that's really the other reason we brought this to OPEGA to really take a organizational look at the commission. Is it doing what it is charged to do? And in the spending of the state's money, is that money going to the state of Maine for the benefit of Maine blueberries? And those are two big questions that go with that. And I think that the history is the piece that needs to be heard, and that will come from the speakers to go forward. 
Thank you. Um, it's really helpful. All right. Um, so I think we have a clear outline. Is there anything else you want to add before I move on? All right, perfect. Thanks so much to the delegation for being here to introduce and good to see you all. All right. Um, so next I would like to invite in um, Director Venturini from the Blueberry Commission to um, give an overview for the committee of the commission and its work and um, and we'll have an opportunity to ask some questions. Good morning, Representative O'Neill. Good morning, Senator Dill. Good morning, members of the Committee on Agriculture, Conservation and Forestry. Hello to the Washington County delegation and uh, hello out there to GOC if they're watching and any members of the uh, wild blueberry industry. They may be wanting to speak later or are just watching um, this briefing. Representative O'Neill, I do have a presentation that I would like to share, um, if that's okay with you. Um, that's great, screen. please, by all means. Can you all see that? We can, yeah, thank you. Excellent. So it's it's my intention with this presentation to, to provide you with some additional context and resources that will address, I hope, the questions posed by the Washington County delegation. Uh, my name is Eric Venturini. I'm the executive director of the Wild Library Commission of Maine. Um, as has been indicated already, there is a lot to this. Um, the Wild Blueberry Commission does a lot with its tax funds. Uh, and as such, this presentation, um, yeah, I will try to do it as quickly as I can, but I hope that um, you bear with me <clears throat> as I go through uh, as I go through this and try to cover the, the ground that I think we need to cover today. So first off, the Wild Blueberry Commission of Maine, it's a public instrumentality of the state and is funded by an industry tax on all wild blueberries grown or processed in Maine. The commission is made up of five processor representatives and five grower representatives. This group of industry leaders employ me as executive director and to serve as the chief administrator. For each pound of wild blueberries grown or processed in Maine, the commission receives a penny and a half. In recent years, our total tax allocation has ranged between $800,000 to $1.9 million per year, depending on production. The commission is organized and defined by statute. It's the main revised statutes, Title 36, Part 7, Chapter 701. And we're dedicated to our mission of conserving and promoting the prosperity and welfare of this state and of the wild blueberry industry of this state by one, fostering research and extension programs, and two, supporting the development of promotional opportunities and three, broadly, other activities related to the wild blueberry industry. The commissioners that serve on the commission, past, present, and future, are the leaders of the wild blueberry industry. These individuals have dedicated their lives to this industry and are incredibly knowledgeable about their crop. Today's 10 commissioners represent 370 years of combined experience growing, freezing, packing, promoting, and are selling Maine wild blueberries. By bringing a diversity of opinions to the table, and they do, the commissioners can, through robust public discussion, identify common goals and allocate the resources to achieve them. I believe that's exactly what the commission is doing. The Wild Blueberry Association of North America is a trade association of growers and processors of wild blueberries from Maine and Canada. There's two separate bodies here. Wabana US and Wabana Canada. Wabana is the Wild Blueberry Association of North America. These two separate bodies work both independently and collaboratively, and they're led by separate boards of directors that represent each country. Wabana US is organized as a 501c5 nonprofit, a Maine nonprofit, and produces, uh, Maine produces virtually 100% of the wild blueberries grown in the US. 
And so for all intents and purposes, Wabana US is practically speaking a main organization. And every board of director and grower, excuse me, every board of director is a grower or processor in Maine. Wabana's mission is to educate consumers in the trade about the indigenous lobish wild blueberry and its wild advantages, increase demand, and to help tell the wild blueberry health story. Now the staff of the commission, myself, my director of programs and our administrative assistant are also hired by Wabana US to manage promotion and health research programs and administer Wabana US's accounts. This arrangement allows for more efficient operations and coordination between the two entities and provides that there are three non-industry people, myself and my staff, who have shared knowledge of all operations. This arrangement proceeds and is fairly similar to the arrangement between the U.S. Highbush Blueberry Council, a national organization um, for uh, our, our primary competitors, the Highbush or Cultivated Blueberry Industry, and also uh, the North American Blueberry Council. So they have these two similar organizations. In terms of shared administration and respective focus areas, the, the split between these organizations uh, is, is fairly similar between Maine and and these two uh, cultivated blueberry industry organizations. I would ask that uh, you all refer to the enclosed memo of understanding, which you should have all received. I sent it out uh, last week uh, for more information on the relationship between the commission and Obana US. I think I need to talk a little bit about the history and trends in this industry, because I do think that that is a large part of where these concerns come from. So this graph shows two things. First, it shows in the blue, uh, what's called farm gate or the price paid to farmers for their raw unprocessed product. The black line shows supply in Maine of wild blueberries. So how much was grown in the state each year? And it's in terms of millions of pounds. Wild blueberry production in Maine began to grow rapidly in the 80s. And anticipating this growth in crop size, the industry formed Wabana in 1981. And Wabana's focus was on promotion and market development. In the mid to late 90s, research indicated that wild blueberries contained high levels of antioxidants. Using funding provided by the commission, Wabana US led a very success successful consumer education campaign to inform the public about the health benefits of eating wild blueberries. The wild blueberry industry was one of the first fruits, if not the first berry and vegetable organization to recognize the promotional potential of the antioxidant health story in the late 90s. Demand surged, followed by farm gate income. And this period was marked by high prices, which ended in the early 2010s. Acreage and yield increases in both Maine and Canada, in addition to exceptionally favorable weather for a period of three years between 2014 and 2016, led to excessive production and record high inventories. Now, we can't consider the production trends in Maine without also considering production trends in the cultivated blueberry industry. And next I'll talk about the Canadian blueberry industry. This graph I think provides a good quick overview of the drastic increases in production uh, that we've seen in the cultivated industry. You see in red is imports of uh, fresh cultivated blueberries, these are our major competitors, and in the blue is U.S. production of fresh cultivated blueberries. And I encourage you to look at the scale. You see in the 1980s, we're down at under 50 million U.S. production, 50 million pounds, and the end of the scale is <clears throat> almost 700 million pounds, and that's just fresh. And 40 to 45 percent of the cultivated industry now goes frozen. And indeed, these increases have continued. And of course, that exerts significant market pressure on our industry as well. Consider back our previous graph, the upward scale in Maine wild blueberry production. Um, we've had a couple of years where we produced over 100 million pounds. This scale, you know, today, especially considering, well, let me just go to the next graph. Uh, so this graph shows three things, imports of, um, on the left here, we have fresh blueberry production, which is U.S. production plus imports. This is inclusive of cultivated and wild. But in the fresh category, this is almost exclusively cultivated blueberries. 
you can see the major increases here in imports of high bush, of cultivated high bush, that's the blue lines. In the middle we have, um, so, so sorry, this is for three years, 2019, 2020, and a projection for 2021. In the middle we have processed blueberry production, which is flatter. Um, and this again is US production plus imports. Maine is the yellow. And on the right, we have the combined. The bottom line is this year, we're looking at a projected amount of 1.67 billion pounds of blueberries in the US. This is a lot of blueberries. And, uh, and the ramifications on, the, on markets, which have impacted the growers and impacted the processors in the main industry are tremendous. Canadian production of wild blueberries has also increased in the last 20 years, which has further exacerbated market pressure. This graph shows uh, Maine wild blueberry production plotted against imports of wild from Canada. That said, Canadian wild blueberry production capacity has tripled from 100 million pounds in the year 2000 to 300 million pounds in 2016. Since 2017, Canadian production has fluctuated around 200 million pounds. And US imports of Canadian wild blueberries, so that's what you see here in the orange, have increased from 50 to 60 million um, between 2006 to 2013 to 100 million in 2015. Since 2016, it's been more volatile. You can see the orange line going, going up and down. Excuse me. The excess blueberry supply in the mid 2010s brought Maine wild blueberry farm gate crashing down to record lows. That's where all of these graphs were leading you. And farm gate, you can see by the red line here, the blue bars shot down drastically. Farm gate stayed below the estimated average cost of growing a pound of wild blueberries in Maine for a period of about five years. Throughout this period, the Wild Blueberry Commission in Maine continued to fund promotional work through Obana US, focusing primarily on the health benefits of eating wild blueberries. Wabana US throughout its history in, in promoting wild blueberries has with frequency conducted market research to better direct their efforts. Um, I'm not gonna go through all of it. There's hundreds of pages we could talk about, but I wanted to just include one quick example, um, you know, that the promotional efforts of Wabana are informed by market research. Uh, this is, you know, one piece of a 2015 study that was done that, uh, you know, identified new consumer targets and messaging that included the multiple health benefits of eating wild blueberries and a new strategy for differentiating wild blueberries from cultivated blueberries. Wabana well, US promotional dollars are traditionally combined with Canadian funding to achieve a greater reach and impact. Successfully promoting generic wild blueberries to the benefit of both Maine and Canada and educating consumers across the world. The story of place and promotional work always included Maine and Eastern Canada virtually the only places in the world that grow wild blueberries. Starting in 2019, Wabana US strengthened its use and promotion of the Maine brand, and Maine now appears in greater frequency on the website and in social promotions. And I would uh, take you guys quickly to the website. So this is the landing page. Um, you can see we focus a lot on families. Uh, just scroll down, this, these are our central health messages. Comparisons, this is really a comparison between the cultivated industry and uh, the wild industry because about 99% of uh, main blueberries go frozen in the form of what's called individual quality frozen or IQF. Bunch of recipes and we have grown in the wild barrens of Maine. I would also point you over here. Uh, last year, Wabana US, in partnership with the Commission's Fresh Pack and Value Added Committee, launched this fresh season page. 
we have some video content here. Um, and the whole, in, the whole intention of, of this effort was to promote the availability of fresh wild blueberries in August in Maine, fresh season. And this page Rep points- Representative O'Neill, can I interrupt for a second? I don't know if I'm the only one. I think I uh, just saw represent, we're not seeing the website, so. I don't know if- Oh, you're not seeing the website. I'm not, I know Representative Osha's not. Oh, yes, if you're scrolling through something right now, I can see a page with a child. How's that? Moving. There we go. Oh, I can see something, yes. Yeah. Uh, what you should see now is social, social media on a slide. Is that what you see? Yes, it is. All right. Um, that's not actually a goal. If you bear with me, let me try to get to the website. Okay. We're all figuring this out, right? All right. So this is where I was taking it. Let's go back to the home page. So this is the home page. Can you all see that? You should see um, a young girl eating some wild blueberries, a healthy scoop of goodness every day. Yes. Excellent. That. Good. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, so this is the home page of um, Wabana US, their promotional website. Um, and this, you know, any promotional campaigns, any efforts that Wabana does to promote um, wild blueberries or main wild blueberries, they all point back to this website. Um, quickly going down the page, here's our central health messaging. 33% more anthocyanins, two times C antioxidants. And this is all setting wild blueberries above our primary competitor of cultivated. Some more comparisons um, between ultimate, between uh, really IQF frozen wild blueberries and what most cultivated blueberries go for, which is fresh. Some recipes and uh, here grown in the wild barrens of Maine, right on the website. And I'll take you up here. This is a page that we did last year. Um, you already heard me talk about it. So this page is all focused around August fresh season. Um, traditionally small, you know, some smaller and medium sized Maine wild blueberry growers um, are in what's called the fresh pack business. They have a, a, a pretty small uh, processing line that they can use to clean their berries and they use that to sell their berries. Uh, fresh, or sometimes they, they then freeze those and sell them as what's called fresh frozen. Um, and this page is all about the August fresh wild blueberry season. And the campaign included social media efforts, which drove a lot of traffic back to this web page. It was very successful. Included four uh, grower profiles of Maine farmers, uh, you know, an effort to tell the story of, you know, of the Maine grower. So now I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint. Okay. So Wabana US maintains through a marketing firm, a very successful social media, several social media accounts on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And activity on these platforms all drives consumer traffic back to the website. Um, on the left, we have Facebook, where we have over, well over a quarter of a million followers, um, which is really the primary driver of traffic back to the website. We have Twitter. We have Instagram um, and, you know, so this is just a brief uh, sampling of some of the types of content that Wabani US runs on those programs. Uh, all that said, branding strategy is an ongoing topic of discussion in both the commission and Wabana. At every commission, every commission meeting is public. Uh, members of the, you know, the broader industry are more often than not present. There's opportunity for public comment. And, you know, how we brand, uh, you know, and how we promote and how we, uh, you know, strategize all this is part of a robust public conversation uh, that the commission then votes on. And I'd, I'd also like to say that in 2020, uh, consumers' knowledge of the health benefits 
this association that consumers have through Obana's promotion. Their knowledge of the health benefits of wild blueberries paid off again. Um, when during the pandemic, consumers' first response was to purchase healthy, long-lasting frozen wild blueberries. According to Nielsen data, frozen wild blueberry demand increased by 52% from March 2020 to March 2021, which outpaced concurrent growth in the frozen fruit category by 14%. And it outpaced growth in the cultivated blueberry category by 22%. And I would suggest to you that these numbers are a clear indication that the health messaging of Wabana US and the commission's investment in Wabana US is quite successful. Effective January 1st last year, the commission's governing statute was changed. Prior to that, the commission was comprised of eight commissioners, five processor representatives and three grower representatives. Under current statute, the commission is a balanced group of growers and processors five grower representatives and five processor representatives. Although the statute was changed effective January 1st of last year, appointments to fill the two new grower seats were made until September 17th, 2020. My point is that the current composition of the commission has been in place for seven months. Similarly, the commission's last executive director left the position for a position at the state in the spring of 2019. In the interim between her departure and my hire, which was about a year, the commission's goals and objectives were carried out by two short-term interim executive directors. And my point here is that since the spring of 2019, the commission has been in a period of transition. Shortly after the 2020 confirmations last year of the new commissioners, we held an all day strategic planning session that happened on October 7th. It was professionally facilitated, it was in person, uh, and of course, because of COVID times, the public were invited, but they attended via Zoom. This, uh, during that meeting, the commission identified common shared priorities, which were subsequently refined by working groups. And in another public commission meeting on March 23rd of this year, we revisited and refined those priorities further. The following strategic statements, um, as they first were developed in October, and as they have been revisited, even just in March, have been absolutely foundational to the commission's work since that meeting. So I'm gonna go through some of those now. Guiding principles. So all of this came out of a very recent strategic planning meeting and is now up, you know, foundational to the commission. Diversify allocations to ensure the program support the depth and breadth of the industry. Do not either intentionally or unintentionally do harm to any part of the industry. We have four long-term shared priorities. One is to improve the economic viability of Maine wild blueberry production. And we try to do that by, by working to accomplish three goals. One, grow demand for wild blueberries, as we do primarily through Wabana promotions and also through other commission-led promotional efforts. Build and promote the Maine wild blueberry brand through differentiation, Maine, Maine from Canada and wild from cultivated and diversification and try to stop the loss of small farms and acreage, which is a huge problem. Two, and our long-term shared priorities is to conserve and preserve Maine wild blueberry land and its human and environmental resources. And to do that, we're working to support the environmental resources of Maine wild blueberry farms and land and we're working to protect the social and cultural resources surrounding wild blueberry production. Three, support University of Maine wild blueberry research and extension. This is something the commission has done an excellent job of for a very long time. And to do that, we communicate industry priorities to the research and extension team. We allocate funding to research and extension priorities through grants to researchers. And we work to increase the university's capacity for research and extension. And finally, Identify and respond to opportunities and threats. And those, of course, are opportunities and threats for Maine's wild blueberry farms and businesses, such as addressing climate change issues, increasing resilience to climate change, keeping Maine farms and businesses appraised of national and international market trends, and determining strategies that align with industry needs, and keeping Maine farms and businesses appraised of changing rules and regs and engage in policy to represent the voice of our farms and businesses. 
I won't go through these in as much detail, um, except to talk about a few of them. These are our near-term priorities and first came out of that October meeting again. But number three, evaluate programs and promotional work for deliverables. This will come in the form of an annual report uh, that I'll deliver to the commission and the broader industry at the end of this year. We're in the process and we'll take this up again in June of de developing bylaws for the commission. And really ever since uh, I started and more so when the commission um, you know, uh, uh, listed this as a near-term priority, efforts to increase the transparency of uh, this commission and trust in this commission from the broader industry. And that I think is primarily through education, telling people about what we're actually doing. There we go. Finally, uh, before I talk about some of the some of the programs and initiatives we're carrying out this year that I think get at some of the concerns raised, um, just in March of this year, in that recent meeting I mentioned, the commission has agreed to this long-term iterative, iterative strategic planning process because we don't think that a uh, strategic plan should be a 200-page document that sits on the shelf, but rather an ongoing process that in this case um, engages the broader industry very intentionally. And we intend to do that by conducting listening sessions region by region in person every other year. I'll report those findings to the commission and those listening sessions will inform the um, revisiting and you know, further development of the priorities that we use as the foundation for the commission work. So a couple of things we're doing this year. Um, this, uh, th this actually started, um, sorry, let me back up a, se a second. So, you know, on the short-term priority of, of increasing commission transparency and trust, we've developed uh, an industry communications, we're, we're in the process of developing an industry communications plan. Um, we're in the process of developing a organization website. At present, the commission doesn't really have a website. Um, and we have started actually in March, I think of last year, this you know, very simple constant contact emailer to help get, get the word out about what the commission does to the broader industry. This goes out every other week. Um, and it started off by providing information about COVID and how that would affect the industry. It's been very successful. Our mailing list has increased organically. Our click rates and our open rates are far above industry averages. We recently hired a student from the University of Maine. Um, he's uh, pursuing a degree in marketing to help us develop a website, which will I, ho I hope to have ready for review by the commission for our June meeting. Uh, this is one of the most exciting projects this year, I think, uh, the launch of the first Maine Wild Blueberry Weekend. This is an agritourism event that will provide on-farm experiences to create promotional and educational opportunities and it'll provide participating farms with opportunities for sales to new customers and provide consumers with a long-term connection to Maine wild blueberries. We're holding it on August 7th and 8th, which is almost peak tourist season because our goal is to get as many tourists out to Maine wild blueberry farms as possible. I encourage you all to attend. At, at present, we have, um, I think at last count, 15 farms that um, are gonna be participating and hosting visitors on their farms to do things like raking, tasting blueberries, and of course, purchasing wild blueberries and wild blueberry products. This project actually started last June. We're trying to increase the connectivity of Maine wild blueberry farms and businesses to local and regional markets. The project also pilots a model of connecting farms and businesses to state and institutional buyers. This project is part of an agricultural development grant awarded last year by the Department of Ag Conservation and Forestry. Now I speak primarily to last year simply because I've been with the commission since February of last year. However, I did speak to uh, my staff and other folks that have been uh, involved in the commission much longer. Uh, and the commission has operated a public education and communications program for, you know, for, for, for many years, frankly. And that program is coordinated grower volunteers to educate consumers about Maine wild blueberries at 
what's called the, the Big E Agricultural Fair in Massachusetts. It's uh, in 2019, it conducted a Maine Wild Blueberry I-95 sampling program. Three years ago, we hosted a Maine Wild Blueberry Chef's Dinner prepared by Chef David Turin to demonstrate the menu versatility of wild blueberries to some of Maine's top chefs and encourage them to call out Maine Wild on their menus and share the story of the state's iconic fruit with their customers. Additionally, in partnership with Wabana US, food service chefs from around the country were invited to Maine to learn about the power of wild and how it could translate to their menus and drive consumer demand. Media and lifestyle health influencers on social media have been invited to Maine to discover the story of wild blueberry, its heritage, its taste, and health advantages, which ultimately resulted in a significant media hit on the Today Show in 2018. Finally, in partnership with Wabana US, we created and delivered to Maine and still do to Maine growers, a variety of printed materials for their promotional use and delivered a periodical newsletter to update the broader wild blueberry community on these and other commission activities. There's a lot more I could say, uh, but I realize I've already used a lot of the time dedicated to this briefing. I would just like to, to sum it up by saying that I know that I and the commissioners understand and hear the concerns raised. Um, in this industry, per the 2017 USDA census, there's 485 farms. I doubt that any one of the farmers that own those places see everything um, exactly eye to eye as far as what the commission does or where this industry should go. We have 10 commissioners, of course, that direct my work, the work of the staff, um, and the, the direction of the commission more generally. And again, they don't always agree. Um, but that is the point of the commission. These individuals bring a diversity of opinions to the table. And at the end of the day, uh, in public discussion and debate, the commission votes on what it is that we should do. The goal of Obama US is to increase demand and they're successful at that job. And I would refer you all to the government evaluation report, which I submitted to this committee in April of 2020, uh, especially the last 40 pages, uh, which is not a narrative, but just shows some more examples of some of the uh, marketing work that has been done um, through commission investment in Wabana US. Um, you know, the, the Wabana US has successfully increased demand, but demand is not, you know, right now demand is, is not the major problem in this industry. The problem in the industry is the rapid growth of cultivated uh, and also the growth going back, you know, maybe a decade or more at this point uh, in Canadian wild production. People are going out of business. Uh, you, this committee has heard me say this before that 25% of wild blueberry tax payees last year, not production. We were down 50% in volume of production because of climate change induced drought last year, but we also lost 25% of the payees into the wild blueberry tax. Kids don't want to farm anymore. However, I don't think the reason uh, behind that, I don't think the reason we're seeing those losses comes down to demand. I think the reason that there's a lot of concerns in the industry uh, is frankly prices. The commission starts every meeting by saying explicitly that we cannot discuss prices. And the reason we do that is because if we did, it would break antitrust law. Uh, there are issues to tackle in the industry, but I don't think uh, the relationship between Wabana and its work to promote an increased demand for wild blueberries um, is to blame for the state of the industry at present. So, you know, the take home mes messages, I hear the concerns, the commission is working to address these concerns very uh, intentionally and very explicitly. And um, it's part of the commission's ongoing work. And, and how we resolve these issues is part of robust public debate and dialogue that is not over and that takes place at every single commission meeting, all of which, again, are open to the public. That's all I have for my presentation. Thanks for your time. I'd be happy to take any questions, of course. All right. Thank you, Mr. Venturini, for that presentation. 
Do I see any questions from committee members? I know I have one, but I want to open it up to folks beforehand. All right, I see Representative Landry with the hand up. Uh, thank you, Chair Dill. Uh, Chair, oh, excuse me, Chair O'Neill. Uh, my question is, what is your total budget for the uh, advertising program? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I asked my uh, staff to, to dig back into the history um, of the relationship between Commission and Wabana. And going back at least to 1994, we have contributed to Wabana US to carry out, you know, as an investment, to carry out our promotional goals, uh, two thirds of the Wild Blue Brain tax allocation. So this year, uh, we received $809 thousand dollars from the wild liberty tax and uh, five hundred and forty thousand dollars went for promotion to Obama US as voted on by the commission on a vote of eight to two. Actually it was eight four one against one abstention. Is that down from uh, the past few years? Uh, so the, the tradition has been to fund Wabana US at a penny a pound. So two thirds of the tax, whatever that tax is, our tax was down last year because production was down. We we had about fifty percent less uh, production in Maine than, you know, frankly, at the beginning of the year we had expected due to climate change induced drought primarily. Um, so I'm, you know, I think I said at the beginning our our budget ranges based on production from one point nine million to. Um, to about eight hundred thousand dollars, which is you know in the past several years, to about eight hundred thousand dollars. That eight hundred thousand is that adequate to carry on a successful campaign as you're doing? <laughs> uh, we could always use more. Um, you know, there's still a lot of industry issues out there to resolve, and uh, and we're working very hard to do just that. Um, marketing, frankly, is incredibly expensive. And that's why so much of our budget goes to marketing. Um, is the $800,000 adequate this year? No, but it's what we have. Uh, both the commission uh, and Wabana US are dipping into the reserves this year in order to continue programs. Typically, what percentage of your marketing expense comes out of the total budget? Uh, Two thirds, so 66% of the blueberry tax typically go to Wabana US for to invest in their promotional work. I would also say though that the commission itself carries on um, what I would call more uh, local and regional uh, you know, marketing and promotional activities. Like I would call the Maine Wild Blueberry Weekend, I'd put that in that category. It's an agritourism event to get folks out to farms, increase direct connections. So that's, um, you know, that's a commission project. Thank you. I really uh, like the idea of your open farm tour that coming up, and I hope that I can get down and enjoy it this summer. I hope you do too. That's uh, that was an initiative of our Fresh Pack and Value Added Committee, so you can thank that. Very good. Thank you. All right, great. Thanks for the question, and I have a follow up, and, and then I'll come to you, Representative Underwood. Um, my question is if. You, um, for you, Mr. Venturini, is if you could go through methodically and explain um, the tax and the and the marketing and um, where that tax money goes and um, just kind of give us an overview in detail. That would be really helpful. And and um, and also, I'm going to request it that you could submit a written primer to the committee since it was such a focus of the GOC request as well. So you're asking me to go through the budget. Is that correct? Um, so what the, the GOC request really centered on, um, on the blueberry tax money and, and how it's spent and things like that. And, um, and your presentation gave a great overview of, of the organization, all the things that it does, um, and the ways that you've worked to address concerns. And I think something I heard bits and pieces of, but not a full overview of was the tax structure where that goes, um, oversight, transparency, um, and Wabana, all the questions that you can find in the original GOC. Sure, um, sure. so I, I'd be happy to try to dive into that now. I'd also point you to the letter I submitted 
uh, with all of the materials I sent to this committee last week. And at the end of the letter, it does go through those three questions explicitly and attempts to address them. Although it does sound like you're looking for more detail on where the money goes, um, I could certainly provide the commission's budget, although I think it is also outlined in the audit that I provided. Um, so would you like me to go through the budget? What I'm requesting right now is, is a print, uh, discussion an explanation for the committee of um, the tax structure, just out of respect for the request that was made. Um, just to help us. I don't think I fully understand. I, I apologize, Representative O'Neill. I don't think I fully understand the question, but I'll do my best. And if you want to kind of guide me along um, based on what you're looking for, please, please do. Sure, I'll, I'll so, give it one more try, Mr. Venturini. So you just got uh, you just got a few questions from from Representative Landry about the tax and how it worked. And I think part of why those questions came up is we didn't have a, an overview. So I'm just requesting an overview so that we can all be on the same page. And, and I appreciate the reference to the to what you've submitted and, and we can take a look at that as well. Sure. So for every blueberry, every pound of blueberries grown in Maine, there's a one penny and a half tax. And that tax is paid half by processors and half by growers. Um, that's the way it's structured in statute. In addition, there is a tax on any wild blueberries processed in Maine. So for example, if um, a company you know, purchases or has operations on both sides of the border with Canada and brings Canadian berries over to Maine to process, say when uh, the you know, at the, at the end of the main season, uh, when processing plants might be standing idle to bring in berries and use that capacity, there's also a tax on those berries. And it's the same, it's a penny and a half. So the total tax that goes into the commission is a sum of penny and a half on wild blueberries produced in Maine and a penny and a half on uh, wild blueberries that come in for processing from Canada. Um, the process, is that uh, in December or January of every year, uh, you know, at that point we have the tax allocation for the coming year. Uh, you know, we know what we'll be working with in terms of, um, you know, income from the tax. Then we sat down with the commission and I bring, I propose a budget to them. Um, and, uh, and, you know, they approve the budget, make changes and uh, we carry out that work for the rest of the year. Uh, you know, to give you a general overview of the commission's budget this year. So again, 540 of that $809,000 um, went to Wabana US for promotional work. Um, and uh, there's about 200, uh, about $250,000. I'm not looking at the budget right now. So I'm just trying to provide an overview. Um, about $250,000 that go for just commission operations. So that's the staff of myself and my uh, staff, uh, you know, uh, just operational, you know, computers, uh, uh, benefits, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then we have, um, you know, another, I mean, we have a number of different programs and each of those programs are funded differently from year to year. So for example, this year, we spent, um, we're, we're, we're going to end up spending just under $50,000 for the promotional campaign and other activities around Wild Blueberry Weekend. Um, we spend about $100,000 a year um, in most years to go down to the Big E Agricultural Fair in Massachusetts. Um, I don't have the budget in front of me, but I would be happy to, you know, submit something in writing to give a more, a uh, better overview of that, if you would like. Thank you, Mr. Venturini. Uh, that would be really helpful if you could um, outline the structure as you articulated it in a digestible form for the committee. Um, I think, you know, one page, um, if you're able to make kind of a chart that explains the tax, what you said about um, blueberries coming in for processing, blueberries being produced, how the commission allocates, um, and then where else that money might go for marketing um, and also oversight. 
something? Uh, I'm, I could speak to the oversight. I mean, the oversight is this committee. Um, you know, for the commission, the oversight is this committee. So I send audits to this committee and to the state every year. Uh, we sent the government evaluation report to you this April. That is part of the oversight process. Um, and and so and then there's Wabana U.S. So what's the oversight for Wabana U.S.? Well, the oversight for Wabana U.S. is the commission, uh, because the commission every year, again, you know, engages in discussion, hears from the public, uh, hears concerns, and then votes whether or not to fund Wabana U.S. Uh, you know, this year, hearing the concerns from the industry, uh, I presented three options to the commission. Uh, one was business as usual, fund Wabana at two thirds of the tax. One was fund Wabana with directives of how to spend that money. And the other was don't fund Wabana at all and take, uh, take the promotional work you know, directly under, under the wing of the commission. Uh, the commission voted uh, again, eight to, you know, eight in a, to approve the budget, uh, one against and, and one abstention. So that is, that is where the money went. Um, if the commission were to decide in any given year to change how they work with Wabana or not to fund Wabana, then the commission would do just that. Um, and again, that is a public process. Thank you. Um, so just to follow up, it would be really helpful if you could kind of spell that out and make a chart that's digestible and addresses that. Um, and I'm going to turn to Representative Underwood. Thank you. Uh, what is Obama? Obama? How do you spell it? Or is it an acronym for something? Or thank you for the question, Representative Underwood. Follow. Uh, Wab question. Go ahead. W Wabana stands for the Wild Blueberry Association of North America. Thank you. Uh, and there's two separate entities here. There's a Canadian organization, Wabana Canada, and there's a U.S. organization, Wabana U.S. Now, because uh, Maine produces virtually all the wild blueberries in the U.S. Wabana U.S. is functionally a Maine organization and it is a Maine nonprofit, 501c5 organization. Uh, Wabana does primarily two things. And one is promotion, you know, as I, as I demonstrated, and then they also do health research. Uh, they provide grants uh, to researchers to better understand and study um, the health benefits of, of wild blueberries. Thank you. The uh, second question basically revolves around the delegation from Washington County. I believe that they're looking for financial accountability uh, by your organization and in the form of uh, what Representative O'Neill was saying. She wanted uh, uh, specific charts or specific language in a, in a view presentation. And uh, I'm sure that delegation would like to have a uh, presentation to them specifically for where the funds are coming from, how much the funds are, and uh, who is getting what portion of those funds. And uh, this is what I believe is the situ situation. And maybe maybe it uh, presents a different viewpoint. Excuse, excuse me just for a second. And if you could Make that presentation to uh, to the Washington County delegation. I'm sure they would appreciate it. And just as a closing, uh, um, if just as a closing uh, comment, that uh, if you could present, what kind of deliverables could you present to the Washington County delegation specifically in order to gain their confidence in what is happening with the commission and. Uh, if you could uh, present that to them and get their confidence through a specific deliverable that they may want, it would be greatly appreciated. So what kind of deliverables can you present to the, the commission, to the Washington County delegation for, to them? Thank you. Thank you for the question, Representative Underwood. Um, I guess I'd start by saying that uh, before this meeting was scheduled. I, I did meet with the Washington County delegation during one of their Wednesday sessions and gave a very similar presentation to them as the one I gave to you and addressed their questions. Um, however, I would 
certainly be happy to follow up further with them and try to further address their questions. Um, my feedback from them after that meeting was that they were satisfied that the commission was carrying out its work. So I was frankly somewhat surprised in hearing their presentation um, before the committee this morning. I mean, the bottom line is there's a lot of people out there with a lot of concerns. Um, you know, not just about the commission, about the industry, about the state of the industry, uh, about their farms going out of business. And the commission is working to resolve those issues. And Wabana is working to do its job of increasing demand. Um, and how the tax dollars are spent, they are part of a public process now. Um, you know, if, if this committee, if GOC, if, you know, growers want to provide more input on how those decisions are made or in, into making those decisions, we welcome, we welcome that, absolutely. Thank you very much for your, thank you very much for your time. And don't forget to send an invitation to all committee members to any event in uh, Washington County Blueberries. Association or anything that you put to put together. Okay, thank you. thank you. Agreed. I think we'd all be glad to attend. Um, I see a question from Representative Landry. Yeah, you may have answered it, Eric, a bit. Uh, can you advertise Maine wild blueberries, or is your connection with the Canadian farmers and operation restricting that? Um, I think that, I mean, first to answer the second part of the question first, like our, our good friend, Dr. Nir Shah likes to do, uh, no, there's, there's, there's no restriction, uh, on our relationship with Canada, uh, as far as what we can do. Wabana U.S. makes their decisions on their promotional strategies. Um, and, and that's, you know, and that's after, you know, debate and discussion, um, I think the first answer, the, the, the answer to the first part of your question is that Wabana is using main branding, as I think I demonstrated by showing the website. Um, you know, consider Wabana's role in supporting, um, you know, they have supported a small part of Wild Library Weekend. Uh, they were a big part of the Fresh Pack Summer page uh, that I showed on the website. That's all hosted on Wabana's website, Wabana US's website. Um, does Wabana always put Maine before wild blueberry? No. And I can't necessarily speak to the reasons that the board of directors have in making the decisions they do. But I think the most important part of the decision is that they want the promotional messaging to match what is found on the package. When a consumer goes into the store and sees a package of frozen wild blueberries with Maine berries inside, whether it's a muffin mix or whether it's dried blueberries or a bag of frozen wild in the grocery store, that package rarely says Maine on the label. And the reason is the companies that make these products, and I'm talking primarily about companies that you'd use wild blueberries as an ingredient, not necessarily Maine companies like yogurt companies, muffin mixes, et cetera. In order to ensure the consistency of supply, they wanna leave the door open to sourcing product from wherever it's available. If they say Maine on their label and Maine has a short crop year like last year, they may not be able to keep that product on the shelf. If their product just says wild blueberries, they can always purchase wild blueberries from Canada, thereby keeping their product on the shelf and keeping that product flowing to consumers and maintaining that shelf space, that valuable shelf space in the store. For years, main companies have been trying to convince their buyers just to put wild on the package. Many of them won't do that. And for the same reasons, they wanna keep you know, the, the opportunity to replace wild blueberries with cultivated blueberries if the supply of wild runs low. But the focus of Wabana has been in, on differentiating wild from cultivated in the eye of the consumer and in the eye of the trade ingredients buyer, while also telling the story of place. And that story of place is increasingly a main story of place rather than a main and Canada story of place. Well, Sounds like uh, you're caught between Mother Nature and corporations. Very good answer. Thank you. Thanks, Representative Landry. Um, 
Mr. Ventrini, my question for you um, as a follow-up is, are Obama meetings public about how the marketing dollars are spent and the, um, and the health research? Uh, that's that's a great question. Thank, thank you, Representative O'Neill. Uh, Wabana is Wabana is not public. No, Wabana is uh, a nonprofit. Uh, you know, it's not a public instrumentality. Uh, you know, frankly, the reason why we why we have this separation is to is so that the cultivated industry does not know about our health research. And so that the cultivated industry, you know, doesn't know about what our marketing strategies are going to be. Um, and it's, 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 it's pretty important to maintain, um, to maintain that, you know, that said, uh, you know, especially with the concerns that have been raised in recent years, when individuals ask to come and attend Wabana board meetings, et cetera, I don't think they've ever been denied. They're welcome to attend. Wabana does provide updates to the commission uh, in the form of presentations directly from the marketing, uh, uh, the marketing uh, company. And Wabana has also, uh, you know, we've kind of facilitated Wabana and, and the marketing company to provide updates, you know, also to the broader industry. It was just, um, I think it was earlier in March where through University of Maine Cooperative Extension, uh, they were holding a winter wild blueberry conference. Uh, we had Wabana come and give a presentation on the promotions um, and what they were doing to you know, anybody that was interested in attending. Um, so you know, it's not like the information is secret, um, but it is also not a public instrumentality. So it's a different type of organization. Thank you. Okay, so I'm hearing the need to protect um, marketing strategy and um, how has this come up in your um, in your conversations about transparency? And I really appreciated seeing that um, that you had facilitated these meetings to and that one of the identified goals was to build trust. Um, how, I'm guessing just based on what I've heard from folks that transparency as to how this money is spent is a is a big part of it just because it's such a big portion as two thirds of, of the tax. So can you speak a, in a little more detail about um, about efforts beyond um, you know coming and presenting to the commission and reaching out to industry? Just what kinds of things have been done to bridge that gap so that folks feel like they have transparency with the Obama money? Um, I mean, I. I can't, I mean, I, I can't speak as well to efforts that have been ongoing to provide, you know, information about, you know, Wabana's promotional work. Um, but I do know that, uh, you know, in, in the past there were, you know, uh, so, so every July, for example, um, the University of Maine ho hosts a, um, a Wild Blueberry Field Day out at the research farm, Wild Blueberry Hill Farm out in Jonesboro. And um, I don't know if it happened every year, but typically uh, as part of that, you know, there's a presentation on, um, you know, what's Wabana, you know, Wabana's promotional work. Uh, I know when I started, there's also winter, winter meetings. And uh, in, the, in the winter conference of February last year, just a few weeks after I started, uh, Wabana was on the deck to give a presentation to, you know, about a hundred members of the wild blueberry industry that attended that. Um, and, you know, previously, it's my understanding that um, updates on Wabana's promotional work were provided at, you know, uh, field days that, you know, happened across the state during, during the summer um, on a, if not regular, but, but frequent basis. Um, I mean, I can, I can go through a little, in a little bit more detail for you all, um, a little bit about where Wabana's money goes um, this year. So 
we, so, you know, so $540, right? So that's how much uh, we sent to Obana this year. Um, I had mentioned in my presentation that, um, that Wabana hires commission staff to carry out the administrative functions of Wabana US. And so Wabana pays back to the commission $95,000 to carry out that work. We have a trade ingredients program, which is geared towards convincing, uh, you, you, know, uh, uh, you know, trade shows and, you know, really reaching out to what are called the trade ingredients buyers. And these are folks that, uh, you know, look to purchase products to put into uh, their, you know, like I said, their yogurt or their, you know, muffin mix or their uh, granola bar or whatever. And so an effort to reach those folks. Uh, and these are, these are fairly small expenditures. And then we have um, digital marketing, uh, which is primarily our website and social media. Um, and so that takes a chunk of the funds. Uh, you know, so, so this year, uh, if you, most, most of our funds can be accounted for. If you take the $95,000 out and then split it in half with uh, a little bit more of it going towards marketing and then the rest going to uh, research, you know, supporting research to, to study the health benefits of eating wild blueberries. I mean. Thank you, Mr. Venturini. I'm just gonna jump in um, just in the interest of time. I think um, I wanna give other folks a chance to um, to speak as well. And I think once we hear the folks who have um, brought this forward, exp you know, outlining um, what they were thinking and looking for, um, I'm guessing that we'll have some follow-up questions for you um, and then we can take it from there. But do I see sure. any other questions from, from anybody else? Looking good. All right, well, thank you very much for your, um, for your presentation. We appreciate your time. Thank you. All right. Um, and Cheryl, I'd like to work with you, please. Um, we had um, Mr. Bridges and Mr. Hammond um, in the room previously. I want to see if they're still here. All right. So on your screen now. Thanks, I'm making it bigger so I can see now. Um, Mr. Bridges and Mr. Hammond, thank you so much for being here and um, and for your patience. I would like for you to introduce yourself, please, and and where you live, um, and to give the committee an update on um, on why you are here today and and involved with this work. Courtney, why don't you let me go first? Because uh, I guess the, <clears throat> so. The concerns that uh, Senator Moore put forth to the GOC is is not. I think we got our wires crossed because of COVID and, and the delay in time. I think it's the message that that we're actually um, or the questions that we have are actually quite different than that. But and, I, and I'm not trying to unscope what what you've already kind of laid out. But but anyway. I'm Greg Bridges. I'm a third generation wild blueberry farmer from down in the Calais area. If you've seen the Facebook page that Eric stuck up there, there's a picture of a two old people on, on an old horse and buggy. And that was actually my great grandfather and my grandfather. So <clears throat> I got kind of involved in the wild blueberry, I don't know what you want to say, later, leadership position back in 2004 after the settlement of the class action lawsuit against the processes for price fixing. And um, it was kind of a mess then because of, I, I felt that it was kind of an unfair process to the processors um, being labeled price fixing because there was never any legitimate way on, on how to fix things. But I was kind of brought in to, to kind of put things back together and find some compromise. And I, they had made me the chairman of the marketing board starting in 2008. And I, I, I kind of got off the board around 13 or 14 uh, 
because I just felt that maybe I wasn't being effective because being the chairperson is hard to criticize an organization that you're, you're trying to run. I have um, zero problems with the way that we market or spend money. Um, if you want to be involved in Wabana as a grower, you can show up to the meetings. You can see all how the money is spent. There's, I would consider zero transparency issues as a grower to find out this information. And it should be kept secret because if we don't keep it secret, it could give our competitors an inside edge on what we're thinking and how our, our strategies work. My main focus is really with the Wild Blueberry Commission in the way that things work out with not the ability to work hard and make money. It seems like sometimes a commission is being utilized to lobby for either bonus buys or special things that really don't help but maybe one or two of the larger processors. And being on the board for so long at Wabana, you know, I used to go along with a lot of things that really didn't make sense because you know, Canada is a direct competitor with us, but it would be better to use, utilize the money to basically do joint efforts for the marketing effort to, to get farther ahead. But the, as I went on longer and longer, the Canadians never failed to not meet their, their expectations when it came to money that the main farmers were brunting all the, the marketing effort. So what happened since then is that the main farmers created a great market for wild blueberries. We actually had a booming industry. Um, when the antioxidant message took off, you know, it, it spurred a lot of growth with marketing decisions, not subsidies. But as things move forward and the Canadians seem to follow the same marketing, whether it's through potatoes, the wood, in, wood industry, or even lobster, is they start putting gobs of money into it with subsidies. The subsidies were for these brand new processing plants, um, tons of land in central New Brunswick and northern New Brunswick. And, you know, Quebec mirrored the same thing. The other provinces did things, but not in such an extreme like Quebec and northern New Brunswick. So what happened is that they started having these surpluses in fruit. And um, I would say that the USDA bonus buy was kind of the backstop to pick up the surplus to basically buy up the crop to buy clean out the freezers. So the information that I submitted, for instance, there was a brand new processing plant that was opened in Northern New Brunswick in 2016, a year ahead of schedule. And as soon as that processing plant that was open with a lot of government stimulus and land, the price failed because we had such a huge crop. I think there was somewhere between 400 and 450 million pounds of just wild blueberries besides the crop that Eric alluded to with cultivated, which has put a lot of pressure on things. So it's almost like the, the commission was being utilized to, to lobby for a bonus buy in the year 2017 that was three quarters of the size of the crop of Maine only. And only ma Maine berries can be put into that system. They can't be Canadian berries. So <laughs> it's kind of frustrating to see that three quarters of the land of the crop is is being asked to bought up by the surplus, and the the surplus you, the USDA bonus buy surplus program is not to basically advance crop sizes or make corporate money. It's made to basically keep a stable farmer network to to grow more fruit through the good times and the bad times. And unfortunately, the USDA bonus buy system is no longer being utilized that way. It's made to basically bail out bad actions from a lot of big players, whether it's the ethanol problem or this wild blueberry and even the cultivated blueberry industry has been using the same program, I think, in, in the wrong manner. So my concern is, is just the way that the commission is set up with processors. These processors don't only just sell wild blueberries, they're selling other things besides wild blueberries too. And we've actually had arguments in marketing meetings about turning down the rhetoric about going head to head in cultivated blueberries in the past because two of the processors in the room were selling cultivated berries. But as you can see, we have changed our marketing strategy. Wild is the most prevalent thing with the marketing strategy and that is a great strategy for us to have. But my concern is that the commission is 
is kind of run by two of the bigger processors. They, they take subsidies on the Canadian side. They have other interests besides just Maine wild blueberries. And I think one of the solutions would be to move to a farmer driven only um, wild blueberry commission if we even end up with having a commission because I think the commission has actually aggravated the problem with this bonus buy program and not calling out these subsidies in Canada. The, the problem with the USDA bonus buy is I have gotten zero response, whether through the FBI investigation into the Canadian price fixing scandal, the, um, the attorney gen or the inspector general to the USDA is non-responsive and neither is anybody the elected representatives that we as a commission lobby for to pick up these bonus buys. So I'm asking that the state of Maine maybe looks in look into the way that these USDA bonus buys are being utilized because you can't have somebody asking to buy up surplus fruit on one side of the border while accepting subsidies to expand the same business on the other side of the border. It creates a lot of fraud and a lot of unhappy growers because it destroys the price because a USDA bonus buy sends bad signals to the market. If you're asking for that much of a bonus buy, do you think that a buyer is going to ask, you know, they're not going to pay anything for the blueberries because it's such a bad signal it sends over and over again. So one of the reasons why the crop was down so much in 2020 is not only what Eric talked about, which was frost and drought, which is, you know, you can call it climate change, but that's just normal activity for the state of Maine. It's too cold, too hot, too dry, or too wet. But there are so many farmers that are not tending their fields anymore because the price is so bad. In 2016 and 2017, when you got 25 cents, we owed money back to the processors because we couldn't, we, we got less than what our advance was as a crop. You cannot make a living like that. The, the commission always talks about not talking about price and that was one of the outcomes of the, the settlement of the class action lawsuit. But we don't get together because we wanna talk about blueberries. We get together because we wanna talk about making money. And that is the only thing that I really think that any of these organizations benefit is to be profitable for the, the whole state of Maine, not for the Canadians, for Maine farmers. So I guess the long and the short of it is that I think there's gonna be three solutions to this. Either the commission goes away, the commission changes from a processor driven entity to a farmer based entity with bylaws stating clearly that they cannot be influenced by outside forces as in Canadian processing or market conditions because we, it's a tough world out there. And if we don't figure out that Maine first if they want to join our coattails, great, but it needs to be a main focused entity. The other thing is that the USDA bonus system is going to continue to be abused until there's some serious changes with it. And I believe that the attorney general is probably the only one that's going to look into something like this, or there's going to be yet another class action lawsuit from some of the growers to basically deal with this once and for all, because it is not there to bail out corporate entities and to, and to grow markets is there is a backstop for farmers and none of this money is trickling down to any of the smaller farmers. So, and then the third solution is continue as is, and you're just going to lose the rest of us. And I mean, there's, I could go on with all the little ins and outs with these subsidies, but it's easy to Google all these subsidies in, in Atlantic Canada and Quebec to see how the government has stimulated a false market using subsidies. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bridges. Um, I appreciate that overview. And um, one thing I do want, want to request from whoever's listening is if we can get an overview of um, Canadian subsidies, just to get get an idea of of that. Um, and I have notes on um, on your suggestions here um, in the context of. Um, of engaging in a further conversation that might that might involve a GOC conversation, would you be willing to talk further about how we can um, drill down on these questions that that you said didn't look um, tailored, well tailored, or or approaching it in the right way? Yes. All right. Thank you. 
Mr. Hammond, I want to invite you to um, introduce yourself where you live and um, and to speak to the committee. Yes, uh, good afternoon, uh, Representative O'Neill, Senator Dill, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Courtney Hammond. I'm a third generation blueberry farmer from down in Harrington. Um, we farm uh, almost 200 acres of wild blueberries and we also grow some cranberries and a few mushrooms. Uh, I currently serve as a uh, chairman of the Maine Wild Blueberry Commission's Fresh Pack and Value Added Committee. And uh, I'm also one of the co-presidents of the Maine Farm Bureau. Uh, a couple of things, I just, I listened to Eric's uh, presentation. I've heard that a few times over the last couple of months, um, but I, there's a few things I'd like to point out. Um, the fact is that over the last 15 years, and, and granted Eric is trying, and he's only been there for a year, and the makeup of the commission in its current form has only existed for a number of months. But over the last 15 years, we've spent $15 million on promotion and research, yet the Maine wild blueberry industry continues to shrink while the Canadians in that same time period have tripled their production. Um, the Maine wild blueberry, uh, Wabana Canada and Wabana US were one in the same entity. They were one organization up until 10 or 15 years ago when the discrepancies in how that organization was funded, primarily due to the fact that the blueberry tax in Canada was a voluntary tax and thrown on top of the, the uh, exchange rate, the main growers were paying 75%, 70 to 75% of the entire uh, marketing and promotion budget that Wabana had. And as a result, you know, people got upset and Wabana was split into the two entities that we have today, Wabana US and Wabana Canada. Uh, one of the issues that I have is the fact that they are still tied together by the apron string. Um, the wildblueberries.com website and the promotion that is done is generic promotion. Uh, you know, Mr. Venturini mentioned that you know, there's more reference to Maine on the website than there used to be, but it's it's a passing reference in the fact that blueberries are grown in Maine and Eastern Canada. There's nothing to differentiate Maine, you know, from the, our Canadian counterpart. And as far as, uh, you know, Maine branding being a topic of discussion, I, I would uh, disagree with that in the fact that Wabana U.S. voted last week not to do that, that they want to continue strictly with generic promotion to create demand, which down the road will result in more availability for Canadian blueberries to be imported or to use. Um, the other thing they're not talking about, and, and Greg alluded to the fact that, you know, the Canadian land base continues to expand. There, there is in process 16,000 acres of land being, being converted into blueberries there now, which in the very near future will result in an additional, you know, maybe 50 or 60 million pounds of additional Canadian blueberries coming onto the market. Yet our commission and through Wabana has done nothing to try to protect the main industry. So this, this shared contract with the marketing that, that Wabana US has with Wabana Canada continues to hurt the main growers. Um, as far as transparency goes, you know, Eric said two thirds of the monies are passed through to Wabana US from the commission, two thirds. Um, and then once it goes, there is no, no oversight. There's no government oversight for, for uh, Wabana US, and there's no commission oversight for Wabana US in the fact that the members of Wabana US are the commission. The board of directors of Wabana US are in fact the mem same members of the commission. In two instances, they wear a different hat. So instead of the father, it's the daughter, or so to speak, but the same companies, the same people, and in most instances, the same people that serve on the commission also serve on the board of directors of Wabana US. So as far as any oversight, um, 
or asking Wabana for producibles of how they're doing, it's essentially like the commission is just looking in the mirror and saying, you know, are you doing a good job? Well, we think so. That that's I think that's one of my biggest issues right there is that they're one and the same. And as far as the the makeup of the commission in its current form, uh, to add those additional two members to tr try to to give the growers a greater voice on the commission. At the time, the commission lobbied against expanding that membership. If if some of you folks would remember that from a couple of years ago, um, and then it was delayed to get those people onto the commission until just September of this past year. Um, if you look at the, you know, recently there was a, an international trade commission conducted an investigation into the blueberry industry in the United States, both wild and cultivated. We were kind of dragged into it. It was initiated by the cultivated folks. Um, that report will say that there's, there's, um, no problem that the blueberry industry in the United States is profitable, that we're not being impacted by these, these imports from other countries, whether it's Canada or South America. The reality is that the processors are doing very well, but the growers themselves, um, again, as Eric showed in his graph, the, in several years recently, the, the price paid for blueberries is below the cost of production. And we can't continue on that way. Um, I think you'll see within, uh, in talking with some of the growers, you know, in the next five years, independent blueberry grower in Maine will cease to exist. Uh, I think I heard Mr. Venturini in, a, in another public hearing last week, make the statement that from 2019 to 2020, 20% uh, of the growers who paid the blueberry tax in, 2019 did not pay the tax in 2020. Uh, that's one in five in one year. Some of that may have been weather related because of the drought, but um, I know that personally in talking with a lot of growers, they're just hanging it up. There is no profitability. There is no new generation coming into the industry. Um, I'm one of the youngest. I'm one of the youngest blueberry growers in Maine, we're, we're, we're dying. A lot of the growers are in their 70s or 80s and they're hanging it up. They're not willing to invest in equipment and infrastructure. They're, they're farming with old, old equipment. Their kids are not stepping into the industry because of profitability issues. And you know, I, I see already some of the blueberry fields are, it's the final harvest. It's a house lot, it's a gravel pit, it's a solar farm, it's a windmill. Um, and when that happens, those never come back. That's the end. You can't plant these wild blueberries. Um, so, you know, we've lost probably 20,000 acres in the last several years of wild blueberries. It will continue to decline um, until there are no independents left, just a handful of, of uh, processors and uh, they'll be buying their product out of Canada, which is what they're doing now. And my, my issue with the commission, and again, you know, Eric's only been there for one year, but there's been no oversight by ACF of the commission. There's been no oversight of the activities of Obana by the commission. Um, and, and they've stood by and watched this industry start to collapse to the benefit of just a few. And, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much for um, bringing this to us. I was gonna say your testimony, but it's not a public hearing, but thank you very much. Um, I have a question if nobody else does. Um, I would like, um, maybe you could kind of give a simple explanation of, of the Wabana structure of who's on it. Um, um, and I also want to request something more formal that, that just gives us an overview of that and how it works from folks listening. So the, the Wabana Board of Directors is uh, made up of the same processors that currently serve on the Maine Wild Blueberry 
commission. Um, same same companies in a, in two instances, there are different person sitting in the chair. Um, there are a couple of uh, independent grower representatives, um, but the problem is that you know there is no no oversight, you know, so to speak, by the commission. Um, there is a membership. I, I don't know exactly how many members there are of Obama now. Uh, I think their dues, <clears throat> maybe seven hundred dollars in dues. Other than that, their their uh, revenue all comes from the blue gray tax that's passed through by the commission. And if you look at the commission's budget under their income line, it will show the, the uh, blue gray tax, but it also show a $95,000 income line from Wabana, which is Wabana giving money back to the commission for the administration. So for the staff, uh, Eric and the staff there at the commission. That's helpful, thanks. Um, and you had mentioned that at, at a point, main growers were paying 70 to 75% of the marketing budget. Is that true now? And what percentage do main growers contribute now? Uh, I think that's part of the issue with the transparency um, in that uh, the shared contract that Wabana US has with Wabana Canada and the marketing agency uh, I believe is supposed to be 50-50, but I believe, and, and how one would go about finding out, I don't know, but that the Canadians are, are actually providing additional dollars to that, to that contract, which if that's the case, um, you know, obviously they're not going to try to promote Maine as a place um, because, you know, they're getting more money from, from the Canadian side than they are from the U.S., which is just the opposite of the way that it used to be. Thank you. Um, I would um, like to request that um, for the committee to get both the historical perspective of, of what it has been and how many years back should we go to look at that 70 to 75% if we want to compare then and now? I don't know. My, my father was involved with the that when they split Wabana, he was one of the folks that brought brought that discrepancy forward uh, to folks, um, and ultimately resulted in that split. But you know, I'm thinking maybe right around 15 years ago that that happened. Okay, let's well, just to um, just to make it safe. Let's say uh, no compare 20 years ago versus um, 15 and 20 years ago versus today, just to get an idea. Um, and I see a question from Representative Underwood. Hi, uh, good afternoon. And could you, um, the gentleman that was just speaking, could you get together with uh, Mr. Bridges and make a presentation to somebody, not only in the House, but in the Senate? And so they can present it either, either whoever you choose to present it to uh, the Ledge Council. And Ledge Council basically is a, is a uh, organization structured for the legislature to determine what should be entered an after hours and after a cloture bill and uh, have them formulate or write a bill or present the, present the idea first, get approval from the Ledge Council and take it from there and have a bill presented to the legislature for assignment to a specific committee, which would probably be this one, um, a formal formalized bill to restructure the industry. Because Mr. Bridges presented three options. And the second option was basically is to restructure the industry from taking the uh, income produced by the growers and for the main growers and use it only for a main main brand and to formulize something along that line and to withdraw funding from uh, let, uh, what is it Obama you it were what us and to withdraw from that and and restructure the industry so it's a grower grower 
<clears throat> sponsored and represented industry to move forward with for say next year or whenever the cycle comes. Um, maybe I, I maybe I didn't clearly uh, explain it, but the basic idea is to get together with someone who can present a, a proposal to the ledge council to get your idea to restructure the industry so the growers have more of a say and uh, whatever tax they pay for main, the main grower uh, pays be used for main for promotion of the main blueberry. And also just as a uh, side note, maybe the main blueberry, once something of this nature started, uh, could be uh, registered as a trademark and promoted as, as the main as a, the main blueberry, not because uh, something of this nature, what you've explained, is prevalent not only with the law, but the uh, blueberry industry, but they have similar problems with the, with the Canadian potato industry and the and uh, loggers. I've heard uh, Senator, um, the state senator from Allegash, Mr. Jackson, uh, Jackson, mentioned that logging they had problems with logging in similar instances with Canadian loggers. So uh, if you could formalize a, a, a bill for presentation to the Ledge Council by one of the members of the Washington County Committee, and so we could get a bill assigned to us to help to organize and uh, put together some sort of structure that you would need to restructure the industry. Um, it would be a great start. I think it would be a great start and um, possibly a solution to the situation. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Underwood. Um, I think I want to talk a little bit about process and what we're doing, and and maybe that will help to go over, um, to go over that. So, folks initiated um, initiated something with the GOC committee um, to do a, a review, and there's a whole department called, or it's it's small and modest, but it does great work called OPEGA that will um, review government. Um, programs and, and spending and the GOC committee's job is to make a work list and to pick what we want to work on. Um, so this item is under consideration right now um, for just that, for the staff to go through in a methodical way and, and do exactly what you were saying um, to think about where improvements can be made. And the meeting that we're having here today is um, it's kind of like a fact finding, like we're opening it up and, and trying to get some more info um, because part of, um, part of what we felt is we needed a little more information to tailor this better so that we can um, make the most of our resources. So um, what I'm thinking here is, should we um, all agree on a path forward that we could bring that back to GOC and make a suggestion? So that would be a way that, that we could do what you were saying and, and use the resources that we have to um, to make recommendations about the best way to go forward. See, um, Senator Black. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Mr. Hammond, for being with us today. Um, and I enjoyed uh, visiting with you on a couple of blueberry tours and uh, your place of business. Um, so what, what you're referring to here um, basically is the only... Uh, the way it's going, it's going to come down to where the processors are the only ones basically left in the fields that they directly um, control, uh, integrated uh, from from where they put, you know, they own or rent or whatever. Those are the only fields that are going to be left to harvest eventually the way the small growers are dropping off. Yeah. In, in short, yes, that's that's the short answer. Um, you know, the independent growers have not been able to invest in any of their infrastructure, tractors, sprayers, mowers, uh, their land, uh, essentially since 2011. And, you know, with the infrastructure aging out and no new blood coming into the industry, obviously, because of profitability, uh, you know, the land ultimately will be sold off, laid fallow, or, or turned into something that's more profitable. Um, that's the long and short of it. I, I look at what's happened over the last several years as a, 
as a paper mill, but it's closing in slow motion. And so nobody's really paying attention to what's happening. And it's having a huge impact on these small rural communities in, in the primarily Washington County, but also in the other areas down the midcoast that where they're also wild blueberry. Uh, it's property valuation issues. It's, uh, you know, small businesses that are being impacted. You know, just a few years ago, uh, one of the larger growers uh, was informed that they, uh, one of the processes was not going to buy their crops. Uh, the result of the migrant workers not coming to pick those blueberries that year, when you think about the grocery stores and uh, gas stations and convenience stores and hardware stores and even the local liquor store. I went and talked to all those folks. I went to school with them. I was in their wedding. You know, it was about a million, million and a half dollars in lost revenue uh, to two communities with a population combined of a thousand people. Um, you know, as this industry starts to, to go away, uh, we're losing a way of life and, and we're losing something that, that makes Maine and rural Maine what it is. Uh, I, I don't, I don't know how to put it any more plainly, but they're, you're right, we're, we're disappearing. Um, you know, I can't afford to replace a 50-year-old tractor with another 50-year-old tractor. It just doesn't make sense. And so, you know, essentially when those things are gone, they're gone. And um, you may have a few, you know, really small growers that are still doing a little bit of fresh or value added. But as far as the, the independent IQF, blueberry grower which you know currently is still close to 50 percent of the whole crop produced in Maine uh, it's in danger of disappearing in the very near future. Thank you. I have a, I have a question Madam Chair um, and I should have asked the executive director but I'll ask you see and I've got you uh, on the, in front of me right now. Um, the, the commission was five growers and five processors uh, your brother Darren, does he represent a grower, or is does he hold a seat for Wyman's? He he holds the seat as a processor representative. Okay, thank you. All right, thanks, Senator Bach. Um, I so I have a few questions. One one question I asked, and these are all kind of information requests for um, fact finding. And I'm going to go through a couple and see maybe if you have any more that you might like to add. And we can also touch base about um, about additional things that will, that you think might be helpful. Um, so far, I've requested the tax structure, how that works, and and where it flows. Um, we've identified um, that we need more information about Wabana's um, structure. And the, and the funding that goes to that. So who's, who's paying how much? Um, something I'd like to hear is the number of main growers that have been lost um, and also main acreage lost over the past 50 years so that we can get an idea of that. Um, I know we saw some graphs in Director um, Venturini's presentation and um, hopefully we can have that data. Um, I'm also curious about Canadian acreage. Um, we've heard that um, that folks are expanding on that side of the border. So I'd like to have data if possible on growth in Canadian acreage um, and data on, um, on the growth of Canadian exports into the US. Um, something that already I flagged was um, an outline of subsidies that are afforded to Canadian growers. And you had mentioned that it might be, some things might be provincial, some things might be federal and, and other sources. So maybe it differs depending where you are, but that would be really helpful for us to get a picture of um, what Maine farmers are competing with. Um, else do I Something I um, also am curious about are, I, I'd like to have more information on the, um, the bonus buy program that was raised by, um, by Mr. Bridges um, 
and just kind of start from scratch. How does it work? Um, when is it used? How much? Um, who benefits? Um, just so that we can get a picture of that. And um, and I'll leave it up to um, to Mr. Bridges and, and Mr. Hammond to determine um, if or requesting data for how much and, and who benefits and stuff like that to, to know how back we want to look. You had mentioned that maybe 15 years ago might be useful for another one of those questions. So maybe we could look at data for the past 15 or 20 years. Um, and I've heard some talk about um, the antitrust lawsuit um, regarding price fixing and and Mr. Hammond, I want to know what what's the significant in your opinion, what's significant about that? What should the committee know? I think the uh, the case law on that is readily available. Um, essentially, there was a lawsuit filed, uh, a class action suit by a group of growers uh, alleging. Uh, processors conspired in fixing the prices uh, to the independent growers. Uh, ultimately, that was settled uh, in favor of the growers. Uh, there was some, some transparency that, was, uh, that came out of that as a result of how, how growers were paid, how the field price or the, the farm gate price was calculated. Uh, not all growers uh, took advantage of the the initial payout. There was an initial payout uh, to the to the plaintiffs for what had happened in the past, but there was transparency in the in the way that the price was calculated moving forward. Uh, that has all since gone by the wayside in the last few years, and and the industry is currently back in the same position that it was uh, prior to that class action lawsuit with regard to price and how it's determined and how they're paid. Um, you know, price the way that the way that growers are paid is a is a huge issue. Um, in that, blueberry growers that sell to a processor in Maine have no idea uh, how much they're going to be paid uh, for the product that they deliver to the freezer plant. So the harvest occurs in August. Uh, they don't know. We don't find out how much we're going to be paid per pound. Uh, until we receive the final settlement check generally sometime in late November or early December. So that's, that's kind of a big issue with, you know, trying, to, there's no, no way for a farmer to be able to plan, you know, plan for the future if you don't even know what you're going to be paid for your crop until several months after you deliver it. Thank you for going through that. Um, and my other question is about um, is about research that Wobana does, and I, I think it's Wobana that we're talking about um, when we say that the blueberry tax is also fund health re health research. Is there anything else that the blueberry taxes would go to that's research related other than health? I think everything is included in that. Um, you know whether it's cognitive function, eyesight, um, cardiac. I mean, there's there's lots and lots of different uh, research projects that are out there. Many of which are are published on the wildblueberries.com website. Okay, so do folks feel like um, uh, is the research accessible? Um, is that part of the transparency issue with Wobana, or is um, do folks feel that they have access to that research and that everybody benefits since those dollars are going there? I'm not sure, you know, as far as like ongoing research, I don't know, you know, how accessible that is. Um, you know, completed research is typically published, but uh, my opinion, I'm, I'm not sure how much the research is actually benefiting. The industry as a whole, um, you know, it's almost like for the last fifteen years since since the big antioxidant uh, discovery 
and the, the very short term result in price increases to the grower that that came about as a result of that, um, they're looking for the next silver bullet that's going to save the industry. You know, whether it's blueberries will cure cancer or blueberries will solve, you know, cure Alzheimer's, I, you know, they just keep looking for the silver bullet and it, it doesn't work. Um, you know, what is it they say? The definition of insanity is, is doing the same thing over and over, looking for a different result. And, you know, yes, we're finding some, some good things out that, that result from, you know, wild blueberries as far as health goes, but, you know, there is no, there's no silver bullet, you know, that's going to save this industry. And, and, I, and I just can't see creating more demand for, for wild blueberries without any, you know, main branding or anything to stop the Canadians from continuing to expand and fill that demand. You know, we're, we're contracting and if it's cheaper to buy for the processors to buy Canadian wild blueberries than it is to buy Maine blueberries, then that's what they'll do to maximize profit. And, and I don't know that the commission is in a, in a place to try to change that. Thank you. Um, you had also mentioned um, the last most recent meeting of the um, board of directors of Wabana. And I'm wondering um, if you can just explain a little more about um, about what you brought up. You said I, something I, about the main a rejection of uh, something related I, to me. I wasn't at the meeting. I was talking to somebody that did attend and um, one of the grower representatives was attempting to uh, get Wabana to try to focus more on, on the main branding and, and to look into, you know, the potential for benefits in branding Maine, like Maine lobster, like uh, Maine potatoes, like Georgia peaches, and the, the board wouldn't even consider it. So which, you know, I, I go back to, you know, the, the statute that kind of forms the commission, you know, it, it lays out their purpose. You know, it says promote prosperity and the welfare of this state and of the wild blueberry industry of this state. And not, you know, I say generic promotion that's benefiting people other than people in the main wild blueberry industry, you know, was misguided. It doesn't work. And, and we're just continuing to decline. And I guess that's, that's my issue is that, you know, who is doing anything different to try to save this industry? We, they just keep doing the same thing over and over and over, just expecting a different result. Thank you. I also want to ask about, um, you had brought up the International Trade Commission or maybe Mr. Bridges did. Um, and I wondered, um, what this, you know, what's the significant thing that we should be looking here for? Um, is it, uh, does it have to do with antitrust stuff? Does it have to do with um, something like vertical integration? Does it have to do with, you know, profit? What, what should we be looking for? And is there a reason to request information in that report? Is there any information about processors there? Uh, about a year ago, um, you know, in, a, in an attempt to react to what was happening with the international pressure of imported Canadian wild blueberries, uh, the commission did take up at its, at its meeting uh, about, about a year ago now, uh, having the internet, trying to have the International Trade Commission look at the Canadian subsidy issue. And that effort to get that to happen was ultimately squashed. Uh, in the meantime, the cultivated blueberry industry in the United States initiated uh, this Section 201 investigation, which does not deal with subsidies. It's, it's a short-term uh, trade remedy, uh, not meant for long-term relief. It's a short-term trade remedy that they attempted uh, based on the amount of imported, imported fruit coming into the United States, both cultivated and wild. And there was some good information that 
that was there, you know, with regard to how much uh, pressure we're facing from, you know, Canadian imports, not just in the wild, but in the cultivated blueberry industry as well. I mean, both of those have just skyrocketed uh, almost at a faster rate than, than some of the, the areas in South America and Mexico. Um, you know, ultimately they ruled that, you know, there was no injury to, to the domestic industry because they said we're profitable. Well, a few people are profitable and the few people that were able to spend the one to $2 million to have a, a law firm represent them in, in Washington, DC, you know, maybe they are profitable, but our blueberry commission opted to sit on the sidelines and watch things play out rather than participate. And even, you know, halfway attempt to represent the industry here. And, you know, I think there was some concern that not a lot of growers uh, submitted the information that was requested by the ITC, but I mean, it was almost 50 pages that, that survey, and it took days to fill that out. And it was information that was just not readily accessible to a small independent blueberry grower. And I think a lot of people looked at that and just said, I, I, I'm not going to bother with that and I'm not sending it in. And, you know, I think the commission looked at that and said, well, I guess those blueberry growers up there in Maine don't care. And, um, you know, but the, the actual issue is the fact that, you know, our, what we're facing really, if you differentiate cultivated from wild is the Canadian subsidies. And we have sent that on to Washington and we've tried to get people to look at that industry, that issue. And there were grower representatives on the commission that tried to get the commission to look at that issue. But obviously the way the commission is made up, they, they chose not to do that. Um, obviously for, you know, reasons around the fact that those companies are international companies that operate on both sides of the border. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Hammond, um, for all your time and, and answering all these questions. Um, then I think we have some, some clear action items to request um, more information. Um, so um, any other questions for the committee before I go to our last um, speaker? All right, thanks so much for being here. Really appreciate your time. Um, Cheryl, I would like to please welcome in um, Senator Moore who has her hand up and um, the last speaker who is um, Marie Emerson, please. Hello, we're back. Uh, well, we, we raised our hands because uh, Representative Tool was going to make a question or a comment, and now he's trying to remember what it was. <laughs> and I, and I, Me. <laughs> one of those days, I forgot my phone in my hotel room. So that's how it, you keep us posted. <laughs> I find my own Easter eggs too. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I do want to thank you all, and certainly Courtney, his Mr. Hammond, his laid out quite a bit of the genesis for our letter i mean it was it was his input that isn't mr bridges that drove the letter but i think through, over the course of the past year it's nice to be reminded of that led to it and i think he has drawn us back into the scope of the letter and there's a direct connection to it and why some of these things need to be looked at about money going from one organization to another and then back to the original and whether that's appropriate or not and whether that's done in the right done in the most transparent way or not and whether the wabana itself is being as transparent as it could be whether both are being as transparent as they could be. and certainly the blueberry commission has laid out some things that it's done to improve transparency, but has Wabana and should should money be go should state money be going from one to the other and then back to the original? I mean that's I mean, that's a that's a that's a question and that that gets right back into why we wrote the letter in the first place. So 
I would encourage the investigation to go forward and the professional staff and resources be dedicated to it. And I would hope that folks would recommend that to the GOC is to Representative Underwood's comment about having a bill. I mean, we have thought about a bill. Maybe a bill is appropriate at some point once the investigation is done. Government oversight comes back with some actual, or, or you folks come back with some actual items for legislation at that point, then then we have all of this history and we could and we would be happy certainly as a delegation to present that. But I think it's a little bit jumping the gun at this point in time to do that. So I just think that's all the more reason why we need to have this and have this settled. And, and ultimately at that time, you know, have a public hearing, have broader input from across the industry. But I think you've got a great framework from from, court, from Mr. Hammond and, and others that have spoken. So I would thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you both. All right, I wanna invite up um, Marie Emerson and, um, and just to know we have a few others who um, reached out and would like to speak as well. And I didn't have, um, have you all on my agenda and I apologize for that. So um, just in the interest of time, I'm gonna see if we can um, see if we're adding new information um, and, um, and yeah, take it from there. Ms. Emerson, Hello. I want you to introduce yourself, say where you're from and, um, and what you'd like to add for the committee. Yes, thank you. Thank you, good afternoon. Um, Chair O'Neill and Chairman Dill and all the members of this very important legislative, legislative committee. Um, you must be starving. <laughs> uh, my husband and I have a combined, uh, represent 119 years of growing, working, research, promoting, and selling Maine wild blueberries. We've had front row seats to this industry for a very long time. And I am here to support taking a deeper look at Maine wild blueberries industry. In this Maine heritage industry of harvesting and processing wild blueberries is to survive against the oncoming tsunami of imported berries from around the world, and a PEGA investigation is needed. A PEGA could save this industry with thoughtful recommendations. They could create a structure that mutually benefits all main stakeholders, putting forth a new era of inclusion to help cure the industry of its main losses in small farms. New thoughtful recommendations could also pre preserve this gifted ancient ecosystem. It's the hardest thing to give up control and power as we've seen with the processors in the LD145 law. Changing disparity will take a set of principled elements to rebuild Maine wild blueberries family farms. An in-depth investigation has been needed for a long time. If 2020 can teach us anything, it's that our decision-making processes can be improved with better information. The Wild Blueberry Commission of Maine and its relationship with Wabana calls for an investigation to see why, after all the Maine state revenues invested in the wild blueberry industry, Maine is still declining, while north of the border, the industry is growing. At the same time, the appetite for blueberries in the United States has grown exponentially. The problem cannot be blamed entirely on cultivated blueberries, as wild is outpacing cultivated highbush, according to the respected Nielsen reports and reported by Ethos, the Wild Blueberry Commission's marketing contractor. Maine is the only state with this phenomenal, biodiverse, ancient crop, one of just four indigenous fruits to North America grown commercially. This unique 
nutritious crop has paved the way in health benefits as a functional and delicious food. So why have our blueberry fields decreased from 60,000 acres to a mere 38,000 in the last 20 years? Why have we lost so many family farms and small growers? Profitability is the answer. Maine growers simply can't compete against Canada's highly subsidized farms with an unfair exchange rate. In Maine, four of the five processors buy berries from Canada. And commission practices actually support this by using Maine revenue to fund and promote a generic wild blueberry and by not using the word Maine in our marketing strategy. Our Maine wild blueberries could be as well respected as Maine lobster or Georgia peaches or Florida oranges. A recent book about the paper industry shares a lot of parallels. The Rise and Fall of Maine's Mighty Paper Industry by Professor Michael Hillard. It shares the story of how Maine once led the nation in paper, as we have in blueberries. It unwraps the political economy. It peels away a century of domination of the political landscape of the political landscape of a few companies controlling the economic workplace, the land use, and the water use policies. Finally, it shows how foreign interests began absorbing family-owned companies for greater short-term profits. This history shares the great and the grim of our destroyed rural communities with many of the same factors surrounding our wild blueberry ecosystem. I view our rare wild blueberry barrens to Maine as the redwoods are to California, or the biodiverse Amazon rainforest is to the world. The horrific loss of so much of this almost 12,000 year rare ecosystem in less than one generation may be due to a collision of factors for the perfect storm. But it was not, I emphasize not, unpredictable. The inaction of the Maine Wild Blueberry Commission is worth noting as losses grew. The only advice given at a recent uh, farmers meeting was how not to grow Maine blueberries, suggesting that farmers basically idle their land. The long-term treatment of growers in a feudalistic system of payments can be traced back to the origins of this commission. We live in the big, long shadow of the 1980s, and it's and its devastating impact of get big or get out and the trickle-down philosophy. To avoid any more loss of this traditional heritage industry, we need to understand how the Commission's impact and a general lack of oversight can destroy generational farms. The ACS Committee owes this deeper look to those farms who have survived and to explore solutions for hope for the next generation. OPEGA could help this industry with thoughtful recommendations. If implemented, a new structure could mutually benefit all main stakeholders, putting forth a new era of inclusion. We need to help cure this industry, this very unique industry, of ongoing losses of main farms. We need to have a chance to save this very special natural gift and ancient ecosystem. Maybe, too, a new structure could even rebuild the trust this industry once had. Good historical investigative information is needed to explain the loss of this heritage industry. An understanding of the Commission's impact on our indigenous ecosystem in terms of macro and microeconomics is needed. We need the Office of Program Evaluation and Government Oversight to ask why all these tax funds have never been measured for outcomes. We need a PEGA to, to ask why the Commission cannot tell the public 
It's a long history of farm loss, the cause, the influence, and the long-lasting effects on Maine's economy. This is a defining moment for Maine's scenic countryside, for these devastated rural communities, and for struggling family farms. Thank you, and I'm happy to respond to any of your questions. Thank you, Ms. Emerson, for um, for that testimony. We really appreciate it. I want to welcome or ask my fellow committee members any questions for Ms. Emerson. Seeing none, thanks so much. Um, and we'll consider you a resource. Um, I know um, I appreciate that you've reached out um, and have been helpful to me in, in understanding these issues. So thanks very much. All right. In the, in the interest of time, I'm going to look um, at bringing the next three folks in, and um, and I'm just going to make a request that we, um, you know, try to say new things. Um, new information for the committee since we've it's getting late and I think we're probably hungry. Good afternoon. Um, I see uh, Mr. Lindholm. I'll invite you to speak first. I see your screen on. Sure. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Nicholas Lindholm. I'm <clears throat> currently a commissioner on the Wild Blueberry Commission. I'm one of the newer appointees that started back in October. I'm a certified organic grower um, and I am the first and only organic wild blueberry grower on the commission. Um, my wife and I operate a uh, independent company, Blue Hill Berry Company, of about 50 acres. Uh, we do direct market most of our berries, though we sell some of them to a processor as well. And I'll try and be brief and bring just new new information to you, but I'd, I'd like to start by th thanking Mr. Bridges and Mr. Hammond, and I, I support them in what they've said and presented. I would also encourage you and the ACF committee to uh, to further the process and have OPEGA review the wild blueberry industry um, and you know, take a look at the commission and, and uh, Wabana as you see fit. I believe much of the frustration, uh, particularly from the growers lies in the preponderance of the governments and decision-making power is held by the processors. And so a couple points I really wanna emphasize is both in the Wild Blueberry Commission statute, processors are defined as minimally processing a million pounds a year. So by definition, processors are large scale. I'm a processor. I do 20,000 pounds on my own farm and market it. I pay the full penny and a half blueberry tax, whereas any grower selling to a processor, as a grower, you typically only pay half the blueberry tax. But I'm as a processor, I pay the full penny and a half tax on all the berries I process, and yet I am not represented <clears throat> on the commission as a processor. The only processor representatives are the large scale, a million pounds or larger. Similarly, the Wabana, the Wild Blueberry Association of America, in their bylaws defines processors as a million pounds or larger. I would also point out the Wabana bylaws requires that the majority of the board of Wabana be processors. So they may have two growers, but that means they have to have at least three processors. The power of Wabana is always in their bylaws held by the large processors. Um, <clears throat> some of the points I'd also like to talk to are like the loss. I, I, I've gathered a lot of data of the loss of main farms. I could quickly read over from USDA census from 1997. We had 741 main farms. By 2007, that was down to 577. And as of 2017, which is the latest national statistic, there's only 435. Um, so there's, there's a loss of number of farms, number of growers in Maine. 
the commission through the University of Maine researcher Jonathan Malacarne is recently wrapping up a large wild blueberry industry survey. And some of the statistics he just sent me show loss of acreage as well, even by county by county. For example, Washington County had 17,861 acres in 97. That was down to 14,222 in 2007. And as of 2017, it was down to 13,668. So again, there, there is data that, that you can be found um, often from different sources, but um, I would encourage the, the, you know, your committee to go and find and gather some of that data. It's very clear. We are, we are losing farms, we're losing acreage, and we're losing the market share to Canada. And finally, I'd just like to address how, you know, that power held by the larger processors in Wabana and the commission has, you know, led to not only that there's no interest or support of differentiating Maine from Canada wild blueberries, but we actually did not fund on the commission any further new market research in 2021. And there's this bias towards kind of a trickle down theory of marketing, whereas you know, most of the market research being done is focused on consumer market and consumer promotion, whereas actually 99% of Maine's wild blueberry crop is turned into the IQF berry by these processors and most of that is sold as an ingredient to wholesale food processors. So their customers, that is, you know, the yogurt companies and, and the <clears throat> food processing companies that are buying the IQF berries aren't getting any of the, you know, we're not doing the market research or promotion to those buyers. Um, and I'll quote from the letter from a processor that in 2019 wrote there that the customers of theirs, of the processor, the customers can substitute cultivated for wild in a lot of their products when the price difference is too great. And in part, they're forced to sell to customers who can buy either Maine or Canadian berries. So most of Maine's wild blueberries are being marketed to these food processor customers who don't care if it's Maine or Canada or wild or cultivated. And that's now trickling down to loss of, of Maine independent growers. <clears throat> and I would just finally say that I think the Maine legislature really can help um, in this by, by not only continuing with the OPEGA uh, oversight investigation, but possibly then by just supporting and passing bills to financially support farmland protection or new farm development or funds for diversification of new products and new markets for Maine wild blueberries, possibly rules and regulations, which could include some kind of subsidies or possibly even tariffs on importing Canadian berries um, or even supporting Maine market, like the, the University of Maine systems recently had to up their uh, purchases of, of Maine produced food. So there's, there's lots of ways that I know the legislature could help in this beyond just this current investigation too. And I thank you for your time. I welcome questions. Thank you, Mr. Lindholm for, um, for waiting, you know, so long. Um, I really appreciate your patience and your testimony. I'm wondering if you could send in um, like a physical version of that, if you could email it um, to the committee so that we have a copy of what you've cited. And if you could also um, send along as part of that, the data about um, farm acreage loss, that would be really helpful. Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll share what I can, uh, what I've compiled. Thank you, really appreciate it. All right, next, I'm um, going in order of my screen. Um, Mr. Merrill, please. Well, hi, good afternoon, everybody. I'm gonna start my video, just one second. Here we go. Uh, I am here today, basically, I was listening in. I didn't expect to have to, to speak <laughs> or to say anything. But let me give you a little oh, bit of background. If I could interrupt, we I have called on you because you're on a list, but do not 
feel the need to, but I want to okay. add whatever well, let, someone had brought it to my attention that you had signed up. Yep. I, I thought I was signing up just to attend the meeting. That's all to, to listen. Okay. In. Right. Um, but let me give you a little bit of background because there may be some questions for me. Um, I'm a commissioner on the Wild Blueberry Commission uh, for 13 years now. Um, I am a fourth generation blueberry grower, but we are also a processor. <clears throat> We're one of what I call the smaller guys in the States um, as far as processing and, and landowners. Uh, but we are a grower processor. And I'm also the president of Wabana US. So the big buzzword of the day. Um, I've been in this position for four going on five years now. Um, basically through assume this position because I've, I do have a marketing background with the University of Maine with a marketing degree, <clears throat> but also as a processor grower and one of the smaller uh, processors, I, I see both sides of a lot of issues. Um, I'm heavily invested in the wild blueberry industry in Maine. As I mentioned, I'm a fourth generation. I moved my family here from Southern Maine to take over the family blueberry business um, 13 years ago. So I want the entire state, the entire industry to succeed uh, without growers, there would be no processors because we wouldn't have anything to sell. We do sell uh, berries to Maine, to the entire U.S., and also uh, worldwide. So Merrill Blueberry Farms does roughly anywhere from four to eight million pounds of IQF, that's frozen, wild blueberries per year. And we do market them uh, or sell them worldwide. We, up until two years ago, were the only organic wild blueberry processor in the state of Maine. Um, now there's one other processor who's come on board with organic, but we did pioneer that, and that was more than 10 years ago um, to become the first certified organic wild blueberry processor. That's a great product. We've had a lot of luck. I've met a lot of great growers, organic growers, and hopefully have helped them along the way. Uh, we have a program where they can buy back their own frozen blueberries and sell to their own customers. So a, a couple of real quick points. I've heard a lot today, and there's great points on, on both sides, every argument. I understand why the Washington County delegation has brought uh, forth these questions, and we're looking for uh, an oversight committee. <clears throat> and I will say it. this is a an industry like no other. We, we have a, such a unique fruit and that it's fantastic heritage uh, that goes back for so many generations, you know, prior to civil war and the Wabanaki Indians, there's so many things wonderful about this, this fruit. It seems like it would be an easy sell, but where we have up to a hundred million pounds or more per year, and 99% of that is frozen, uh, We've specifically taken the tact of promoting it as a wild blueberry versus a main wild blueberry for a number of reasons. Uh, when you get to the 100 million pound range and you add another 300 million pounds from Canada, you're no longer a, a little niche, tiny um, specialty crop that's, that's uh, you know, hard to find. You're a commodity and you have to compete with major commodities, specifically cultivated blueberries. <clears throat> As Eric showed that graph early on in his presentation, that was just uh, US cultivated blueberries. Uh, that's almost a billion pounds, a billion with a B of cultivated blueberries. And you add British Columbia and Mexico and Peru and Chile and Argentina, um, China who's growing uh, cultivated, wild, uh, cultivated blueberries now. And we're, we're a small fish in a big pond uh, of blueberries. So yeah, we want to continue to differentiate wild blueberries every chance we get. This past year, Maine had a 54 million pound crop. I think there was only about 45 or 46 million pounds grown in Maine. Um, and another nine or 10 million pounds were, were imported fresh from Canada and processed here. So a 45 million pound crop in Maine translates, if you do a, a penny a pound for marketing, that's $450,000 to market Maine wild blueberries. Uh, cultivated had a $10 million budget this year to market cultivated blueberries. Uh, you, you can see the, the struggle we have. So I, I, I could probably ramble on forever, but I don't want to repeat what a lot of uh, good people have already said. So if there are any questions, I'd be happy to hear it. If not, move on to the next speaker.
Uh, and thank you for your time. Uh, I didn't mean to not open uh, my statement by, by uh, saying hello to you, uh, Representative O'Neill. And I think Senator uh, Dill is not on anymore, but uh, no disrespect there. So thank you. If there are any questions, I'll hear them now. Thanks so much, Mr. Merrill. Um, really appreciate that. And I want to invite you to um, submit anything in writing that you'd like the committee to consider as part of this process as we develop um, what um, we want to do going forward, including um, what OPEGA could do to be helpful. So I'd love to, to have written comments on that from you so we can include that. Thanks again. Um, Mr. Bell. Sorry about that, I was still muted. Um, good afternoon, Representative O'Neill, um, distinguished committee members. Uh, I mostly wanted to just introduce myself. I didn't have a lot of, I didn't have really any prepared uh, remarks. Um, I am David Bell with Cherry Field Foods. Uh, Meanwhile, Blueberry Company in the Chayas is our um, processing operation. Uh, we're a main based uh, grower and processor, but we are one of uh, the Canadian owned companies and have been since the um, early 1980s. And uh, for those of you who don't know me uh, from 1995 to 2014, um, I worked uh, for the Wild Blueberry Commission and uh, early in my career, I had an, a lot of other ag related jobs and I hold uh, a bat bachelor's of uh, plant and soil science from uh, University of Maine at Orono and a master's from UMass Amherst. Um, and I'm currently uh, a commission member. And uh, for the last five months, um, I've been chair uh, of the commission. Um, I'll just make a couple comments um, on, on markets. Uh, there's a lot of things to look at and address. Um, but uh, as Todd mentioned, uh, you know, roughly 98, 99% of main wall blueberries are IQF uh, process. Most of that goes into either the trade ingredient or frozen retail uh, through the health story. We've been able to really open up the frozen retail channel as being uh, very important. Um, but the companies like ours, main wall blueberry company that sell into those markets, uh, the vast majority of the time, we have no control over how the resulting products, whether it's wild blueberries put into a yogurt or a wild blueberry pie or into a bag, are marketed on the shelf. In other words, whether they put just blueberries, um, wild blueberries, you know, main wild blueberries or wild uh, main blueberries. So, you know, I think a lot of um, a lot of the issues that have been brought up today. Uh, comes down to how markets work and, um, you know, what we can achieve um, and focus on, you know, as a small industry and the idea of, well, why are we focusing on consumers and uh, not uh, through the commission in Wabana? Well, the, re the reason is, is first of all, those of us that sell in the industry, Obviously, every time Maine Wild Blueberry tries to make a sale, we try to sell a Maine Wild Blueberry because we're the Maine Wild Blueberry company. Um, but as I explained to an, at an industry meeting the other day, if the customer doesn't want a Maine Wild Blueberry, they want a Wild Blueberry, we're happy to sell them a Wild Blueberry. And if they don't care about wild, we're just happy to sell them um, a high quality uh, blueberry. But um, in order to ever have a chance, and it's a long process, ever have a chance of getting uh, the, the customers, or excuse me, the packaged good company, goods companies to put Maine on the package, they're gonna, if they think there's a value in it. I mean, there's a, you know, a specialty jam company in the Southern part of Maine that, uh, uh, excuse me, especially food company that has a jam and they put wild Maine blueberry because they think that's the best order um, for their company uh, um, to sell product. But, um, you know, if we as the seller cannot dictate to the end user who may be a couple customers down the line, a food prep company makes something that goes in the yogurt and then the yogurt uh, company decides to put 
uh, whatever label they want on. If those food companies feel the demand, you know, from, you know, from the consumer, you know, that's, that's what drives them at the end of the day. And in listening to the discussion the last, you know, couple of years here within the industry, because we've had good market penetration in New England and New York, the Northeast, and there's a lot of people that travel and come to Maine as tourists, you know, Maine is recognized. Meanwhile, blueberries are recognized. You get further beyond and they're not. So, you know, I think, and where we're going as an industry that those, you know, one or 2% that sells into that regional market, we do have, you know, a net benefit in the marketplace having Maine on, on the label. Um, but, you know, heretofore at this point in time, you know, where the vast majority of the berries are sold, um, you know, past New England, you know, we don't have that benefit of Maine. And interestingly enough, uh, we actually have a lot of customers uh, that their preference is they want USA wild blueberries. And why do they want USA wild blueberries? Well, they want to be able to put USA on their bag. So that's just one example that there's just many, many layers, you know, when we're trying to figure out what's the best way to to bring the most value. So anyways, we, uh, we stand ready to provide, uh, you know, information um, to the legislature and work forward. Thank you. And I'm happy to, uh, if there's time representative to field any questions. Thank you, Mr. Bell. Um, I appreciate you um, jumping into the conversation. Any questions for Mr. Bell? All right, seeing none. Thank you. Um, I think so that wraps up um, who signed up today to come and speak with us. And I think this is a little bit different of a structure than, than we're used to um, in a formal public hearing because we're under this oversight kind of umbrella. Um, but just for anybody still listening, I want to note that for next steps, we've requested information um, and we'll get the results of those information requests. and. Um, and work with you all to determine next steps um, so that we can address the concerns that you brought to us. And we really appreciate that you have. So thanks to everybody. And um, I think our committee of three, could I get a, a motion to adjourn? All right, looks like we're good. All right, thanks for sticking it out. Take care, have a good afternoon. Bye. Bye all. See you Thursday.